right? It wouldn't be fun. It wouldn't be an adventure if there weren't technical difficulties right at the last minute. Yeah. So anyhow, I am here today with the amazing and beautiful and talented. And you, I, I, I don't want to oversell Patricia, but she tells the best stories. You're going to be sitting there. You should have like popcorn because the way she tells the stories is so great. But anyhow, Patricia. Then you have the carajillo. And I have a carajillo. Carajillo. So let's tell the guys what Carajillo is, actually. Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna tell them, but first let me tell them who you are. Yes. You are Patricia Zavala. I, I always I'm gonna screw it up, right? Zavala. That's correct. Kugler. And she is she was a child actor. She also is a producer. She's also a unit publicist. She also has the most amazing family of musicians and actors and writers and directors and producers. And she has so many stories. So just buckle up, buckle it up. Okay, tell everybody what, okay. So this is what happened with the Carajillo. We were in Mexico, we we're in San Miguel de Allende. And it was about, what time was it? It was like three or four o'clock. And I was like, you know, I can't decide, do I want coffee or do I want a drink? And so then Patricia says, Remember what you do? You remember what you said? You were like, you were like, oh, you can have both. You can have coffee and you can have a drink at the same time. Exactamente. This is called carajillo. But we have to have some respect for this drink because it's amazing. We have to say carajillo, carajillo, carajillo. Carajillo is an espresso on ice with liquor forty three, which is a Spanish liquor. And you put it both on ice, and it's an amazing drink for the midday, just like now. If you guys have something like this at home, do yourselves an espresso. You can even, if you don't have the liquor 43, you can add what kind. I have a chef right here. What kind of liquor if they don't have 43? Banana liquor. Banana liquor, cocoa liquor. You know, it is amazing drink. Mm. Vanilla vodka. If you had vanilla vodka, that would work. Mm, it is a it is a Spanish drink, but Mexicans popularized it. You know how Mexicans do everything so big production out of everything. So the, the Mexicans made it huge, and it's very fashionable uh, and and very cool for the now in in I don't know how cold it is in Chicago, but here in in, in San Miguel it's very hot, very. Um, but then again, San Miguel is always hot. It what's not when I the last time I was in San Miguel, it snowed and it hailed. It hailed like snowballs. I was there, so I met um, Joy Carson. If you are out there, we need you to 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 say hello. We won't put too much pressure on you, but it's through our friend Joy Carson that Patricia and I met because Patricia does so much work like on production for commercials and advertising and everything. But um, I, that was my, no, that was my first time in San Miguel. And it is like a bastion of art. There is art everywhere. And there's also there, it's in the middle of the mountains. And the one thing, no offense to us Americans, but when I like to go on vacation, I like to go on vacation. There were so many Americans there. So can you, like, Patricia, explain to us why it's so arty and why there are so many Americans there? So San Miguel is a, a, a very old city, uh, and this and only the architecture uh, attracts a lot of people from the arts. And not only that, but in the end of Second World War, uh, the American government make, uh, made a, a sponsorship or... Uh, to, for uh, for veterans to come study arts and folk art in Mexico and send them to San Miguel, they were sent here. But it got uh, it was they were promised that the famous muralists would would teach them, but none came. Only Siqueiros did, and Siqueiros is an amazing muralist and painter, and he don't tell anybody was mega red. He was a communist. So this uh, Red Sicarius is the same guy that through Stalin had Trotsky killed in Mexico City while living with Diego and Frida. Wait a minute. So that's how Trotsky died? Was yes. he was he was like they had a mark out him and somebody killed him? Yes. So so Trotsky came here, the Mexican government embraced him, and then he went to live with Diego and Frida at Frida's house at the Casa Azul. He was hiding in a closet. 
He literally came out of the closet for to move to his own bunker around the corner from Frida's house. So he was hanging there, but Stalin was going nuts looking for him. And he contacted Sitelius, this muralist that was a teacher here in San Diego. And he asked him, can you please help me kill this bastard? And he did. He, he paid this Spaniard butler, a butler, who then stabbed him to death in his bunker close to Frida's house. That is not a way to die. Okay, and, and, and everybody, just so you know, this is how this is gonna go the whole time. So I just wanna actually throw it out there. If anybody has comments, questions, they wanna say whatever, like put them in the feed because I will show them, I will throw them in here. Oh, my friend George just makes a comment. San Miguel de Allende is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. Yeah, it's true. It's true, George. George. Four years in a row as the most beautiful city in the world. And it's a bunch of artists from all over the world that eat here. Uh, some years ago, about 15 years ago, this friend of mine in Porta says, Patricia, are you in San Miguel? Yes, I am. Can you please look for my mother? And I go like, what do you mean look for your mother? Yes, she went there for the summer and it's Easter and she hasn't returned. She's been there forever we're, and she's not responding. She just, she just sent an email and said, we're happy, leave me alone. So I went to the salsa night uh, downtown and I went from the picture and I went like, Senora, I'm Patricia, I'm friends with your daughter. They're all looking for you. Well, don't tell them to call me, I'm very happy. And I said, I, I'm living with this matador. The matador was like 20 years younger. And I went like, Senora, this guy is taking advantage of you, of course. So what? I have the most beautiful house. I have the most beautiful lover. And I have the most beautiful life. Don't tell my family where you found me. So I had to shush. But this story, because a lot of people came from all over the world to study the art here, folk art and everything. And there's the connection with Chicago. Like this page says, Chicago, Mimi, and Patty in San Miguel. The connection of Chicago and San Miguel is huge because there was a guy in the 1938, a guy called Sterling Dickinson. He came from Chicago from a very wealthy family on his car, drove him all the way down to San Miguel. He was a writer and he believed this town is amazing, like we all know now. This is 38. Then he came back to the States, worked for the Naval Intelligence during the Second World War. And after that, he returned to San Miguel and said, I'm never going to come back. I'm going to stay in San Miguel. He bought a house for $90. And then he started doing this with every, inviting everybody to come to San Miguel for his art school. And that's how it started. He got acquainted with every other Mexican and with the muralist to be teaching there. But guess what happens? The Time Magazine and even the, the Washington Post back in the day said, it's a red haven, bunch of communists down in San Miguel. So, so what? It was about art and about fields and about seeing the unfairness all over the world. So they were just not communists like that. They were just uh, soft in their hearts and they saw how, how uh, terrible it was throughout the world. They, then they said, don't listen to the Americans in San Miguel because they are, they are against the Korean War. So they got extradited to go to jail in the States because of the wealthy family of Sterling Dickinson. They all got released and came back to San Miguel. But not only them, a lot of Europeans did as well and, and Asian, but more, more Europeans and, and Americans. And they started this beautiful um, art school, Instituto Allende, but before that, it was the School of Fine Arts filled with murals of Siqueiros, beautiful. So uh, the people remained, they stayed here, they married into Mexicans, they had family, and most of them are our cousins now. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it's it's so interesting because like all of this happened so far back. I, I think about when, um, when, it was, when people were fleeing the U.S. to try to dodge the draft so they didn't have to go to Vietnam. A lot of people, wasn't it, didn't that art school get accredited so that people could, could register for classes there and then go to pretend like they were registered for school to avoid going to war? Es correcto. But then when, when they were going with the, with the press, uh, going like, oh, it's a Red Haven and whatever in San Miguel, 
uh, they they just started stopped sponsoring them. But it was they didn't have to because it was basically wealthy Mexican families and artists from all over the world, from wealthy families throughout the world that would sponsor this. So the school still goes on and people from all over the world come here. Just like Robert Rodriguez comes here to shoot the Once Upon a Time in Mexico movie and many others. Many others have shot here because San Miguel is so beautiful that it's a set on its own. You cannot believe how beautiful San Miguel is. If people are looking at us, they should just Google San Miguel images and they cannot believe it. So one time I get this, this script uh, back in the day uh, from this New Yorker team, beautiful amigos, and they were doing this movie called The Ten. One story was a, a Winona Ryder, one other story was Jessica Alba, the other story, but the one I had to produce with my brothers was uh, the Gretchen Mall one with Justin Thoreau. He was not as famous as today. And they were coming, the story said, that he was a American teacher coming to a Mexican town, falling in love with a Mexican carpenter who was just in the road, and and then they would like fall in love during their vacation. So she literally falls in love with Jesus, you know. So what you don't know them is that on the email they said on the scene where they fall in love, it's supposed to be the ocean. And I went like, why the ocean, silly? If you want to shoot the ocean, just stay in your country. You can do San Francisco. It's a close shot because they're falling in love. Do the Caribbean in, in Miami, whatever. You don't need to come all the way here. If you want them to fall in love, come to San Miguel and look at the skies and the architecture. There's where people fall in love. So they, they I sent them the images and they said, we're there. They come from this for the scout. We're scouting. This is the Mercado number one. This is the market number two. This is the church fucking such. This is this and there. This is the scene where, where, where the lake where he walks on the water, the Jesus guy. This is that. This is this. Next thing you know is uh, let's let's um, have them fall in love. Ah, where's the ocean? They went like somebody hasn't been reading their emails. I went, I literally <laughs> told you they could fall in love here. Give me a Mexican second, I went. So I sent a PA to the parroquia, the big church, and I said, don't pick up the phone. It, there was no smartphones back in the day. It was a little Nokia phone. Just go there. When you see me calling you, don't pick up the phone. Just light the church to keep the priest on your left hand and with your right hand, just, just uh, light the church. And then to another church in the back, I did the same with another PA. So I put them on the rooftop of the hotel at the main square that belonged to the family, and I go like, so here is a scene. Look, they're falling in love here. How about this? You see the couple stones, you see the colors. Look at the skies, greens and red and oranges. And then I press my Nokia phone, memory number five, and the church lights. Oh. <laughs> and then I go like, oh, we can do it on the other side. Let's turn around the camera and you'll see. Here you got the half desert on the there. But look at the skies on the top of the desert. How can you not fall in love here? And then I press memory three and the church light also. And they go like, oh my goodness, this is so amazing. We want to shoot the love scene here. And I went like, that's what I've been writing you on the emails. Next thing you know, if they were going to shoot, it's overcast. Man, no sunset. We have no red, no orange, no nothing. Overcast it. So I go like, what do we do now? And then the producer and the director, all both from New York, and the actor, they all the three of them stand in front of me and they go like, and now Patricia, smart ass. And I take my little Nokia phone and I call the Mexican airport is the most accurate weather channel there is. So I called Senor, is it going to rain in San Miguel? And he says, Senor, if it's windy, it won't rain. But if it's not windy, it will rain. And I said, Senor, please. Don't tell me what you feel. What does a satellite say? I have my patrons in front of me. I got to give them a, a straight answer. I repeat, if it's windy, it won't rain. If it's not windy, it will. Next thing you know, as I'm hanging up saying chinga to madre, a wind breezes by and takes away the clouds. And then we have the most beautiful sunset in the world. And the actor Justin Thoreau says, who are you on the phone with? And I go like with your father. <laughs> right? Because he's 
he was because playing he was Jesus. Playing and then the, the producer, the New York producer said, oh, your savalas are so well connected. So this gossip went on. And sometimes when somebody's shooting someplace else, they just call me, make your phone call, Patricia. We need the rain to stop, make your phone call. I know. It's like, who, like, who who's in your Rolodex? Like direct dial to God. It's pretty fabulous. It's like the red phone, you know? If, or the, if yeah, the red phone, the bat phone. Patty Chica can do it too. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh. Well, and so, okay, so I want to speak in, because you keep saying Patty, and obviously you're Patty, but you've got, there's so much to say about like, about Patty Smith. We were talking about Patty Smith the other day. And you know, I'm, I'm a huge Patty Smith fan also. So tell me. She's from Chicago. She's from Chicago and then she was in Detroit. She came up in in my um, call on Thursday because she's now on Bella Union, this record label out of the UK. That's what that's her UK record, her European record label. But anyhow, so do tell. She's talking about it. Patty Smith is the most beautiful soul I've ever met. But when I picked her up from the airport, she was telling me how such she was a teenager and she felt like her mother uh, who was a waitress, but also trying gigs and stuff. They were not coming from a um, family that would support her easily. It was a lot of fun. She always felt not love. And she comes to Mexico and tells me that her first trip to Mexico, she was 16 and she had $9. And she left home, take a, took a Greyhound bus to the border, took a second bus and fell asleep all throughout. Veracruz, which is the southern part of Mexico. They they stopped at this terrible city that I don't really like, neighbors to the town where Salma Hayek was born. And she doesn't have any money, nor does she have any place to stay. She doesn't speak the language, nothing. It was all her story telling me this. So she went into a church and sat down there. There was a mass going on. And she said, well, whatever God can feed me with, so this woman comes in, very humble woman, with several children and a baby in her hand. And she was pointing at a two-year-old, saying that the guy is sick. Somehow Patty understood that the guy had a fever or something, very sick. So she, in some way, explained to Patty to hold on to the baby, take care of the baby, I gotta run to the doctor. So Patty understood this and was holding on to the baby in the church. It took two hours and she was thinking, is she coming back? Am, now a am I now a mother of this Mexican baby? What is going to happen? And then she returned with all the children and she invited her over to her house. It was a mud floor. They had nothing to eat but beans and dry tortillas. She said she never felt more loved than she with all these children and all this hum humble Mexican family. And she stayed there for a month helping them it, it, with the corn and everything. She lived there with this Mexican family for over a month until she could have earned some, a little money that this poor family was giving her so she could move away and look and, and search for whatever other future she wanted. But the connection, uh, you know, the connection between Patty Smith and the Beat Generation. Well, yeah, she's a big, because of her poetry and her relationship with Burroughs and all of that, yeah. But let me finish this last visit when, when she got interviewed for the for the Levi Strauss book. Uh, she said she wanted to go to Frida Kahlo's house. So we went there. This is Frida and the sentence, the beautiful sentence at the entrance when Frida Kahlo got her feet cut off and she said, Amongst their quotes, they are beautiful. If people don't know it, they, you should really search for the quote of Frida Kahlo. And at the entrance of the museum, you can see on the wall a quote of her saying, of her own house, the Casa Azul, going like, feet, what do I need you for if I have wings to fly? So, Sam Smith got so um, emotional. She started crying and walking, everything. She said, can I lay down? hear it in, in Frida's bed. I said, not really. It's really a museum, you know, senora. But she didn't care. She lay down there on the on the, on the bed and said, I know now what she was feeling. I had something to write about the butterflies. Can I write on the wall? And I said, of course you can. This is something. <laughs> but then I don't know how it happened, but she got the permit to write on the wall. 
So if anybody looking now comes and visits the Frida Kahlo Museum, you'll see Patty Smith poem about the butterflies inspired by Frida at the Casa Azul. Beautiful. And and what I what I love about that is just all of the different art forms that that involves. You know, you've obviously got Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, and then you've got Patti Smith. She's a musician and a writer and a poet. And then her relationship with Robert Mapplethorpe and all of the artists in New York at that time when she was living in New York. Like it just shows this uh, in, in interconnectedness of the arts and cross-cultural. It's so, it's just like, it's, it's so yummy, I love it. I know, and the most amazing thing is it, all these people, all these intellectuals, they all came to Mexico and got inspired in Mexico. The big generation, I mean, borrowed. He came and shot the wife here by, by accident, of course, as they were testing all the psychedelic drugs. He was desperate because he could not find heroin in Mexico. We have no heroin, but we have other things used to that. So, uh, he is living in La Roma. Does it sound familiar? Roma neighborhood, you know, like the movie Roma. Well, it's a, a very French influence. It, it is like a Mexican Paris. You got the bistros, you got the walking district, and everything. Most of the surrealists uh, live in this area, as well as uh, boroughs. Anyways, he was drinking a lot, and the wife. She was uh, trying all this crazy drug. And then he said, why not do we feel the William Tell and put an apple on her head and shot her? It was in Mexico where he shot the wife. Of course, it was not an accident. It was all prepared. He didn't do it on purpose. But regardless of that, he pointed the gun and shot the head. So he goes to jail in Mexico. <laughs> the family who was wealthy, they talked to the Mexican government and he got extradited, of course, then freed in the States, in the States. But the jail he had in his soul was more terrible than the jail he could have spent time in, in Mexico. So because he was really, he never got over this. But then there's lots of pictures, fantastic images of young Patty Smith with James Bullard. And they were talking about Mexico and what Mexico was all about and blah, blah. But regardless of them, there was also new chassis. So this is this is a segue to a um, romantic, melancholy situation. Yes. That's 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 the that's the segue because not only did he live there, but he also died there. Yes. Uh, when when you go like Neil Cassidy coming to San Miguel, it could be like the all oh, the green boys here, whatever, because it's the origin. It's really the hip uh, the hipster look, the little hat, the aviator glasses, the white t-shirt, the jeans, and whatever, the contraculture and things. But it was not new for us in Mexico or nor in San Miguel because we are we were familiar with all these foreigners living in the town because of the school I told you. 20 years earlier. So when when Neil Cassidy comes here, he is at this wedding, they say, although actually the locals say it was a bordello, uh, and he was there testing drugs, getting some alcohol, blah, blah, and then he wanted to go home, but then instead walked all the way to the railroad tracks and was completely numb, comfortably numb, walking there as the train goes by and almost killed him. There's two stories, two sides of the story. Some say that he stood in front of the train to get killed, and some other people say they found him in a coma, lying next, door, next to the railroad track. They took him to the hospital in San Miguel, and it was stated at the autopsy that he was only paralyzed some of his kidneys and things. Of course, they may interview the doctor, and he said, he's a foreigner. I cannot say he was filled with drugs. It's against our politics. So he didn't really say he was completely in drugs and alcohol when he died. I don't so, know if he wanted to commit suicide or not. That would okay. Go. So then we don't know if it was actually the train or an overdose, but it was obviously it was obviously influenced by the drugs. See. And then we shot a little short movie about it 
the director from Texas, Ty Roberts, he wanted to shoot a short movie about just about his death. I don't remember the actors, and they were pretty, pretty famous, or later they became famous. I will search. But for now, the story goes, the hooker at the bordello was Andy Garcia's daughter, Dominique Garcia, and the other actors, I don't remember their names. Anyways, there's, he was wanting to do this very surreal. So there's an old guy, Mexican guy, very brown, and has this dress as a Katrina. You know the Mexican Katrina? Like the skeletons for Day of the Dead with the French hats. Yep, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Dress on a white horse. This is all in black. And he was sitting on a white horse, crossing in slow motion the railroad tracks. Okay? That was the scene of his death. Next thing you know, I'm standing there, and a bunch of sheep from a local shepherd Started crossing the railroad tracks and I was saying, "Stop! Stop! Stop! You're running the team. We're shooting. Stop the sheep! Stop the one. sheep! Stop! <laughs> stop the sheep. Stop sheep!" And the director said, "Oh, Patricia, what a production! A uh, value. Please do it again." Oh my goodness! <laughs> well, because you can't, you can't make. You can't make you can't make that shit up. You cannot make it up. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh! Um, somebody made a comment that um, the 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 video is frozen. Hopefully, we are back, not frozen anymore. Mark Dunker, it might have been. I went. It, it's probably it's internet for sure. But Rob Robbie T, it's muy yummy. Okay, para ser okay con nuestro friend. Ah, so yes, Rob. When you come to Chicago, la próxima vez, when you're in Chicago, you have to meet Rob Tovar. He works at, um, I work out of a creative incubator space. You would love it. It's called 2112. And there's a big area where we shoot and it's called the hangar. And there's a great place to shoot. And then there are all these studios where musicians rehearse and record. It is fantastic. And a lot of productions will work out of Fort Knox, 2112, the hangar. But Rob Tovar is like the head kind of producer of the hangar. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, you'll you, you Rob Tovar. Yeah, you would love it. You would love you would love Rob. In um, Spanish, you would say Tovar. But you know Tomar. how to everything, you know. So anyway, yeah. the connection between the states, between Chicago and Mexico, has always been there. Like I was telling you, the Dickinson, Sterling Dickinson guy that started these art schools and the sponsorship for for the veterans in uh, to study arts in Mexico, in San Miguel, was from Chicago as well. His wealthy family came from there. And he was sponsoring along with the American government for all these young people to come into San Miguel and study the arts, but more folk art. And a lot of, uh, he wanted to preserve the Mexican heritage, although he was not Mexican, he was American, but he was very fond of our, of our traditions and our art. And that was very nice. We have a name called under his name. He was a big, great sponsor to this town for art. I love that. We're like, um, we're like sister cities. Yes, we are. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So we talked about that type of art. What about some of the surrealists? Because Buñuel lived there for a while too, right? And didn't Dali spend some time there? Yes, 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 yes. They all did. But it, it, it was a it was a weird uh, story because first off, uh, when the muralist started being so big, everybody around the world went like we can do the same. Even the American government was sponsoring Polak to copy our art, and the smashing of the paints against the wall is a type of a copy of a Mexican artist. But we don't take it seriously. We admire Polak as well, and it's okay. But uh, what happened back in the day is that what is going on in Mexico? What's with this muralist? Even Rockefeller paid Diego Rivera uh, yeah. to do the, the, the Rockefeller Center over there, but then he painted some communist things and he didn't like it and said, Senor Rivera, put that down. Are you laughing at me? And he said, you already paid and I'm not disrupting my paintings. So Rockefeller and his people were disrupting the mural, but he had a copy because Tina Modotti, Parenthesis, Tina Modotti and the photographer Western and Enrique Pierre Bresson and all these photographers from all over the world, Italian Tina Modotti, American Weston, 
uh, Enrique Gabriel Bresson from France, were taking pictures of the murals. So they knew how it was supposed to look like. So now if you come to Mexico City, I will take you to see the replica made by Diego Rivera about what was disrupted by Rockefeller. Anyways, why was I, that? I, just, I, I, have to, I have to point out how kind of perfect and almost ironic that is that that Rockefeller like it's it's sort of you know life in imi the art imitating life imitating art you know th the fact that it was Rockefeller that was like sorry this art isn't okay and then Rivera's like well too bad and I'm gonna do it, it, it it's just so perfect see but the but the, the the funny part of the Diego Rivera story is that uh, Diego Rivera was actually born in the state of Guanajuato San Miguel belongs to the state of Guanajuato. So Diego Rivera is from the neighborhood. When he was born, he had a twin brother. Almost nobody knows this story. And after I tell the story, I will have to kill you all. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, you're all safe. There's not any kind of situation that's gonna happen. We're right. all safe. You're all safe. Uh, or wait, let's see. Because remember the sure list. Hmm. Anyways, guess what happens? Diego Rivera is born. But the mother had a, gracias, she was pregnant with twins. And, and they were not uh, doing very well when they were born. They were very sick and, and slim and things. So the parents in the Guanajuato home, because the parents were not poor or anything, they were in a accommodated uh, uh, social level. They went talking to themselves going like, I think this guy, one of these guys, the twins are going to die. And the mate from Guanajuato, from the from the mountains, from the hills of Guanajuato said, no, senora, our babies are born like this. Allow us to take the baby with us eh, because the other twin died, unfortunately died. Let us take Diego, Dieguito, to the mountains and we can raise him with our atole from the corn and everything. He can, he can be well again. Let us take him. So Diego Rivera, was born in the hill, was raised in the hills of Guanajuato, looking at the day of the dead and the candles and the colors and the mysticism behind it and the unfairness as well, because he saw this accommodated family in Guanajuato and then he saw the real life in the hills, how these poor people are still going with the flowers and the candles and everything. So when he came back, and told the parents, he, the father saw him at 12 year old. He was almost like a furniture this big. He made it incredibly. So the father said, what do you want to study? And he said, I think I want to be an architect, but I want to paint. So he was sent to Mexico City. The head of the, of the architecture school, San Carlos, was Antonio um, Rivas Mercado. He's the same guy that built the Angel of Independence in the middle of Reforma Street, such a majestic angel, then made also by the Germans in Berlin, almost the same angel. Remember? So anyway. Oh, I do, I do actually remember. I only was in Berlin one day. I have to go back to Berlin, which we have to remember to talk about your dad too. I'm just putting a pin in that. We have to talk about your dad. She, 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 we haven't in, in, in the uncles, yes. But then the, the Diego Rivera, comes to Mexico City and, and he started painting and everything at this school, San Carlos school. And the, and the guy that the architect that built the angel, and, uh, Antonio Rivas Mercado went and said, hi, why don't you paint like a grown up? Come on, you're painting like a little child. What is that? You have potential. Stop doing painting these pretty faces already. So he what belonged to a very wealthy family in Mexico. So he gathered the money for Diego Rivera to be sponsored, to move to Europe and in France, go to painting lessons, so for him to learn what the great guys were doing back in the day. But he was already a communist heart. He already felt like he had to go to Russia and had to do all this other social movement. When he came back, he started amongst others, the Communist Party in Mexico. That's why when Trotsky was running away from Stalin, that's why Diego Rivera, through the Mexican government, had him stay in Mexico safe, you know? But anyway, Diego he was safe. He was, he was safe until he got stabbed to death, right? <laughs> see, 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 see. 
safe until then with cicadas, the same feature with the veterans in San Miguel years later after the Second World War. Yes, you're right. Anyways, what's with the surrealists? Why would they want to come to Mexico? What is the idea of Mexico? Why is everybody talking about Mexico? So, first off, is Leonora Carrington. She's English. She was escaping from a crazy father, a very strict father who didn't want her in the arts. So uh, she was fleeing from a mental hospital. The father put her in in Santander, Spain. She escapes, runs to the Mexican embassy. What do you know? There's this Mexican poet that holds her and embraces her and says, I will save you. They fly to New York. She was going loony because she was in love with Max Ernst, the German and they were living in the province outside Paris very nicely until uh, the Germans came in. And then the, the, the French didn't like that. And they, when they lost the World War, they took Max Ernst into jail. So Leonora Carrington was a very young girl who went loony without the love. What am I going to do? I don't even speak the language. Where am I? I cannot go back home. My father is crazy and things like that. And then they put her in a mental hospital in Spain, and she escapes and goes, runs to the Mexican embassy, and this Leduc poet, Mexican poet, saves her, takes her to New York. She's in New York, and in New York, she gathers with the surrealists, and amongst them, guess who is there? Max M, and now he's married with Peggy Guggenheim. She was not pretty, but she was wealthy, and she was sponsoring Max Ernst but he was really in love with Leonora Carrington. But after being a while in New York, the poet, the Mexican poet said, let's go to Mexico. And that's how she moved to Mexico and lived and had a wonderful career in Mexico. Okay, so wait, so time, wait, so time up. So Leonora Carrington, she's in love with Max Ernst. She's living with him outside Paris, in Paris. She leaves because it's not going well. She leaves and goes to New York with this Mexican poet. And then she runs into him again. She runs into her old lover in New York. Yes. A, like a continent in an ocean away, she runs into him again, like almost like fate, destiny, whatever. Yes. And so then it inspires them to like go to Mexico and escape yet again. Yes. And she comes and marries this poet because he's a savior and he's in love with her. She, we don't know exactly because she was very local. She was very crazy, poor thing in her head. She made, she made the most beautiful art, uh, Leonora Carrington, and had a very nice surreal friend escaping from the, from the fascist in Spain, moved to Mexico and also living at the Roma. They were very, very best friends. So Leonora Carrington and Remedios Varo have similarity in their art, surreal art. But they went to the Mexican cantinas. If anybody that doesn't speak Spanish doesn't know what a cantina is, it's a Mexican traditional bar with mariachis, the loud music, the tequilas and stuff. And they started gathering there with the other surrealists that started coming. And then Andre Breton, the father of surrealism, learned about Mexico, what is that? So he came to Mexico as well, and then was gathering with the mariachis and everybody at the same, at the same cantinas. And then next thing you know, Guess who's sitting right there at the cantina with the other surrealists? Max Ernst and Peggy Guggenheim. She cannot escape this guy. She can't. She can't. She went all crazy. But then she divorced this Mexican poet and lived on her own. And then uh, there's another part of the story, a little gossip now. There's a guy called Sir Edward James from Ireland. And he hears about Mexico and about Leonora and comes and follows her and started sponsoring her for the arts. The most, the largest uh, surrealist manifestation in the, in the world is Sir Edward James at, on the hills of the jungles of San Luis Potosí. He made this incredible um, help sanctuary for surrealism. The, it was almost like extra paintings, like the stairs don't go anywhere, and then there's doors that don't follow anywhere, and blah, blah. He always wanted to be a painter, a surrealist, but he can, could never. He didn't have a thing, but he was sponsoring them. So Sir Edward James learned about this jungle because of Leonora Carrington, and in Mexico, he goes there to the jungles and sees all the orchids, uh, being born there and all the beautiful colorful birds and everything and he said i want to buy this land for like two pesos 
and bought the land and, and built the most incredible surreal uh, haven there is in the world. You have to go there. Uh, but still, where did is your Edward James, where did he get all this money? Why was he a sir? Whatever happened? You know what they say. He's a bastard child of Edward the Seventh. That so means, actually royalty, like he's a half brother of the queen. Has that been? Do you, was there any like proof of that at some point, or no? He it's just a, when he got interviewed, he often because he didn't want to royalty names or titles. He wanted to leave all that and move to Mexico where nobody knew him. And, and built this with the locals, this incredible palace that is still there. He didn't want anybody to know, but when he got big, he got interviewed and he said, my mother is half sister of Edward VII, which was not true. Could not say I'm a bastard child of the king, you know? But anyways, you can search your own. But yeah, we can search our own, but it's it's interesting because I think that that would be a very dangerous position, right? Because the king would not want anybody to know about this bastard child, and it would be a threat to the throne if people knew about it. It would just be, there would be too much politics. Too much politics. And talking about politics, guess what? what? We have two big French interventions. We had a war, the Cinco de Mayo is one of the battles we won against the French. It's not our Independence Day. We don't celebrate as big as they do in New York. We we don't do the Corona beer uh, celebration with, uh, with Cinco de Mayo. We just don't give a, a big deal about it. But in America, they do, uh, whatever. They can celebrate the Latinos anytime they want, but it has nothing to do with history. The second intervention is when the conservative party goes to France and asks Napoleon, Napoleon, we have a chaos in our country. We need some royal like you do in Europe to, to, to help us uh, organize things. And they bring in Maximilian from Habsburg. The only castle in the continent, Amiga Mini, the only original castle in the continent is sitting in Chapultepec Park in Mexico City. There's no other castle but the Walt Disney one that is a fake and the original one, the Habsburg one, that is on the hills of the Chapultepec Park. Very beautiful. And he came, of course, with the Austrian entourage and the whole thing, Pompa with the in Spanish. And, and, and there was Maximilian. This guy was so very nice. He's the first guy that did the civil rights in the whole continent. We're talking now mid 19th century. He's the one that said the Indians are no slaves. Let ch children labor forbidden. Women have the right to work and it's only eight hour day, which didn't exist throughout the world. He was the only Habsburg that was a liberal. What an irony because he was brought in by the conservative party. But then the conservative party uh, lost their uh, power and we had to unfortunately kill him. <laughs> he was very nice and all, but we had to make a statement. You cannot just come from abroad and be a president or a king or, or an emperor. You know, we had to make a statement. And he was so nice that when the, 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 the soldiers were going to shoot him, he took out some coins, golden coins, and paid them for their service to kill him. But the gossip, I didn't tell you the gossip. No. It's the gossip, it's where the gossip is. Do you remember the movie Sissy? Sissy the Emperor? Sissy? Romy Schneider, Romy Schneider. This movie about Romy Schneider, beautiful empress, uh, married to Franz, Franz Josef in Austria. There was a big movie back in the day. Anyways, he's a little brother of Franz Josef. And, but everybody in this house from the Habsburgs, because they married into families and without, you know, they were all having hemophilia or a big head or, you know, they were all like sick. The only handsome guy in the family was Maximiliano from Habsburg. And they were wondering, what in the world is what happens? Napoleon was in the Austrian court and they say he was very close 
to the mother of Maximilian. So, so the, the local history, the gossip says that Maximiliano was actually also a bastard child of Napoleon. I see a stop. That's Maximilian of the Habsburgs. When the Mexican, you heard it here, folks. Was when the Conservative Party goes to to Napoleon and says, "What do we do? We need a, a royal in our country because everything is a mess." He says, "Why not little Maximilian? Because he's the son, and he had no title. He had nothing, but the the the, the crown in Mexico. That's why he was sent here because of Napoleon." And, and it makes perfect sense because number one, it gives him a title, and number two, it gets him out of France or, and uh, and like out of Europe, so potentially safer, but not really safer because he ends up, you know. I know. Unfortunately, Napoleon took over Spain, and that's how we got our independence because they're all distracting with. Napoleon wanted the brother Jose to be the king of, of Spain and the Spaniards were all fighting about it because they wanted Charles IV and then Felipe VII, uh, the son, why why a, a French guy will be a re leader and whatever. Meanwhile, we plan our independence. That's how we got rid of the Spaniards. And, and, and this, it will, okay, so now what popped into my head is talking about Cortez, but I think we need to like, take a time out and talk about your dad a little bit because okay. because i want everybody to hear about your dad and his work with the berlin symphony and tokyo symphony and stockholm symphony all of that so please like tell everybody a little bit about your dad because i think they'll want to hear it but back in the day uh, in the guanajuato families when uh, you were not supposed to do arts because it was not well seen so there were poets in the family, there were musicians in the family, but they just did it inside for Sunday afternoon or Saturday Saturday afternoon for the guests. So there's where the children would come out and perform. There were uh, uh, 12 brothers and sisters, the Zavalas, and the, fa the grandfather that was uh, the mayor and everything. You were not supposed to play for public. But then there was a Mexican president, the one that developed Acapulco, also with the movies related, as well as Puerto Vallarta with the Night of the Iguana and Elizabeth Taylor and the Kennedys. I'm sorry, I just stepped out for a while. Coming back to the story, they go, the uncle goes like, oh, yeah, there's going to be at the Palace of the Fine Arts, downtown Mexico City, there's going to be a fantastic showing about all the performances of Mexican art. Can we, can I bring the children? And my grandfather went like, no, they're no Maria. She's not gonna perform in public what are you saying but the uncle said well i got them tickets can they just at least go and see for themselves what is going on in the art uh, scene in mexico and the and the grandfather said okay whatever so they go downtown the audience is all uh how do you, diplomats from all over the world and at the end of the shows of everybody performing my great uh my that my grandfather's brother said, go on stage now, children, go on stage. What, what, really? And they performed. So the first thing that they have to play was opening the Tropicana in Cuba before Fidel in Batista times. Then, okay, come to Germany, you have a TV show here. They were going for four months and they stayed for four years because the Berlin Sinfonica went like, is this guy a composer, which was my father? Can he compose? And he said, if my brothers are playing the piano, yes. So 12 pianos in the Berlin Sinfonica, conducted by my father, playing my father's music. And then the Swedish went like, oh, we want that too. So he conducted the Stockholm Sinfonica. And then in Israel, they traveled also. And in Greece and, and throughout uh, Europe, in Italy and, and everywhere. So they become huge abroad. Then they come back to Mexico. Of course, when they were in Germany, my father falls in love with my mother, who was a translator for them. She spoke several languages and was a beautiful woman. And my father decided to marry her. And then they came to, they moved to Sweden for a year for the uh, Sinfonica in Stockholm. And then they came to Mexico to have us all. But it was very family oriented, the, the show. They, they were performing in various uh, uh, languages and with various uh, instruments. And, and when we were little, uh, of course, it was family, and they were asking us, 
to perform in the theater, for the TV shows. And then they said, can they sing jingles of children? Yes. Can they be perhaps in the commercial? Because we knew we were children actors, but we knew how to behave because it's very difficult. If you have a child on set, it's annoying, you know? But we knew we had a German mother, come on, and we had a father musician and composer so and producer. So we would behave and everybody loved us and everybody wanted us there. Then we grew up and uh, some crazy producer made a show called The Patty Show in Baja California. I had The Patty Show and I was Patty on the show and, and then, I gained, I gained some weight and I had to move from the small screen to the big one. That's how I started in movies. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to say oh, that. Oh, mira, mira, quien es? Es, a ver, Tim Panarelli. I have not seen Tim in forever. I think the oh, last time. Tim is so gorgeous, I love Tim. Tim is Mexico with me and he has done the whole tour with us. He knows about the Aztecs and about everything. Tim Portanelli so handsome. He's so handsome and so wonderful and so crazy. The last time I saw him, Kenny's band was playing uh, after a Cubs. It was it was a big Cubs uh, Cubs party and Tim's really good friends with all the Murrays like Bill Murray, Brian Do Doyle Murray, Joel Murray, all the Murrays. But, um, and at this particular concert, Eddie Vedder was there. And then Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam came and played with Expo 76. And Tim was at this, at this party at this little yacht club. It was really, really fun. But anyhow, I loved him. And Tim, I hope that you're well. I haven't seen you in forever. And Tim and I used to sing songs, remember Tim? Ich habe meinen Koffer in Berlin. We had such much fun. Remember Tim? <laughs> yeah. the German, there's the Germans because my grandmother from Germany was visiting with all the, the, the friends and, and, and we would bump into them in every event we were going and Tim would only scream, oh, there's the Germans again. Because <laughs> when people ask, you have German? Where? You don't look German. And I saw my tone of voice and the size of my back. There's a German in me. Jewish German. <laughs> Jewish German, see. Jewish German. And well, and, and I, I love that my friend Jennifer, I don't know if she's still watching, but yeah, she's part German and her husband's German. I think Jennifer's part German. And yeah, I'm I'm part German too. Yeah, it's like the big, like the wingspan. The wingspan is like strong no, German stock. It's okay with you, with your beautiful shape, but when you are short Mexican, it doesn't suit, you know? You're beautiful, Patricia. So, <laughs> callate. Callate tu boca, yeah. Beautiful. Oye, so going back to the surrealist, guess what happens? Okay, what's next? All the surrealists, they moved to Mexico, of course. There was big movements, of course, the beatniks. Some people would might not understand this because they're too young, but the beatniks, they were the beat because they were going to places where the black people would play and the beat, and they got all upset because, you know, we're not supposed allowed to, to go racially different than your own after the Second World War, and they go there, oh, they are the beat because they go see that this bars, hang at those bars, and then mix because communist Sputnik, so the beat mix. Mm. So they were going on the road, crossing the whole country back and forth, meeting all these people, blah, 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 whether they were in Columbia University or where, Neil Cassidy never made it to college, but he had a friend. So he used to visit the place just to see, make friends because he never went to college. But the others did. And they were from, from prominent families in the States. So anyways, they were doing the on the road kind of thing, like the book and the movies and everything with that. And then they said, why don't we just go to Mexico? I think Mexico is in. And that's how they came to Mexico and started acknowledging everything that was going on here as well as the surrealist did. So you were asking before about Salvador Dalí, who was sponsored by Sir Edward James, the one with the surrealist castle in the middle of the jungle hills. He was sponsored, Dalí was sponsored by him, and Dalí came to Mexico and hated it. Por qué? Why, why would he hate Mexico? 
He said, I'm leaving. I cannot be in a place that's more surreal than my art. <laughs> and left. But then also remember that Buñuel, as you were asking before, came to Mexico to shoot a whole bunch of uh, very exciting and incredible surrealist movies. The first movie that they shot, Perro Andaluz, back in Spain, was Dalí, co-producing co with Buñuel. Well, yeah, yeah. It was very crazy and nobody liked it because they're very conserved. They were very conservatives, you know? And then, of course, you got Franco and the fascists and things. So when Wendy decides to come here and splits with Dali because they started to make movies together, but then they split after the Perro Andalus failure. Of course, it's not a failure. Back in the day, it was a failure for the Spanish audience. But then in Mexico, we allowed him to do whatever he wanted. Of course, you can shoot here whatever you want. That's why everybody wants to come and shoot here. Not only have we have the best scenarios everywhere, but we have very incredible crew. There's two big unions for cinema in Mexico. We don't only have the best locations. We have the best crew. We have incredible, incredible houses for rental, for everything. You know, we can shoot here. Anything. Everybody loves it. Schnabel, Tarantino, Robert Rodriguez. Everybody loves to shoot in Mexico because you can shoot whatever you want. And it's always exciting. And we have a very incredible crews to prove it. That's why Paramount, Disney, uh, well, all the big studios come and shoot here too. Not only independent movies, talking about independence. Okay, we have another story coming. And and yes, so anybody in the film industry, anybody in the commercial industry, you know, as soon as we are out of the Corona, Coronaville, um, let's all go to Mexico and shoot all of our projects. Yeah. I'm, down. I'm totally you know, down. So many movies are shot. You're starting with the big Titanic, the Man on Fire, the, the original scenes, the Zorro, the every big... Hollywood success was shot in Mexico, a lot of them, you know? Every single, every single Hollywood success was shot in Mexico. A lot of them. Yes, it, nobody can beat the Titanic still, you know? And in San Miguel, Anna Roth, the producer, lives here around the corner from us. She's probably there. Anna, are you there? Anna, if you're there, come out, come out wherever you are, just comment comment and let us know. I actually, I'm curious where everybody is from that's watching this right now, because I'm sure they're, they're mostly your friends and, and my friends, but you never know who's going to be watching, right? So it'll be, oh, check it out. You never know. Japan is in the house. Um, so my filmmaker designer friend, Aki from Osaka, it says that it's her dream destination. Aki, you would love San Miguel. And you you would love Mexico City. You would love Mexico. You would love San Miguel. And you'd love Patricia. Everybody loves Patricia, obviously. <laughs> and and you know what? We have Hong Kong. Stuart Sender is there. Uh, are you there, Stuart? And Joy is there. Ita Ville from Germany. And then we have, who else? I cannot see on this. Uh, Oh, oh, my friend, yeah, yeah, my friend, yeah, and and my artist friend Karen. I always screw it up, Karen. If you're in Arizona or New Mexico, I think it's New Mexico, but I always, I don't know why, I always mix up Arizona, and New Mexico. I just do because it's the it's the desert and it's arty and it's awesome. But um, she's in the house too, so you definitely you've got some good you've got some good coverage in the U.S. in so in Latin America and where else? J Japan. We've got Germany. We've got everybody. Everybody's in the house. That's why this is like the global cafe. Don't forget. Austria, I'm being told that Austria, oh, there's Switzerland with Ferreira Hunkeler. Oh, there you go. So, oh my gosh, uh, check it out. Anyway, I know it's going to be late. The Germans are saying goodbye. Of course, they need to go to bed. But, uh, they are asking whether this is going to be recorded if they can see it later. What do I tell them? Oh yeah, seguro, yeah, 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 yeah. So once this is done, it stays on the page. It stays on the page, so they can always come back or they can hang out and they can just wake up late tomorrow or they can come back tomorrow and this will still be on the page. Fantastic. You can tell them. Fantastic. 
Muy bien. So it's not only the big studio movies that we shoot in Mexico, or it's only not the pictorics that we are famous for in Mexico. We are famous for our fashion industry, for our embroidery. Emme, are you there from New York? Uh, well, our embroidery, I was wearing this on purpose today. Look at this. It is a oh, it's gorgeous. Look at this. So this embroidery has been copied and is now at the was now at the Fashion Week in New York, and we all go like, Emma, my American friend, who's a, a fantastic director, who is now in New York, by the way, she's New Yorker, but she has a house here in San Miguel, and she was so pissed that they were stealing our heritage and copying it and putting it on the, the great, fantastic uh, catwalks everywhere without saying it is Mexican and without getting all these women, the royalties. These are humble Mexican women on the mountains of Mexico in Oaxaca, making all this for us. And, and it gets copied and this French designer says, well, I registered it. Why did you, senora? And she said, well, the Mexicans never did. I go like, senora, we don't register heritage. It's not a design that you're gonna register like that. It's our heritage. And like our heritage is also in music, like you can hear our music all over the world. You can see our fashion all over the world. You can see our beautiful women all over the world. It's everywhere in the Victoria, in the, in the fashion, in the music. The influence that Mexico has in the arts is amazing. It, it will never stop. It started with Diego Rivera in France because he was in the position to say, I want the world to know what Mexico is all about. We're talking now the 20s and it never stopped. We're still all over Mexico because of our art. Some people don't even recognize it's Mexican art. Some people uh, make bad publicists about Mexico and Mexicans, but guess what? It's a whole bunch of souls that are artists in the soul, hardworking people and beautiful country. Mm. The, I, I love Mexico so much. I, I there there are so many places. I, and you know what kills me though? I have to go back and I have to go back to Mexico City because every time I've been to Mexico, I've been I've gone to other little places and I've gone through Mexico City, but I've never actually stayed in Mexico City. And there's so much art there. I have to go. I have to go back. There's even an architectural art uh, thing when it's above Baroque. You call it call it churrigueresco. So the facade in Mexico City, downtown, it's more than Baroque. It's, it's absurd. It's called Churrigueres, but it only exists in this country. And you were asking before about our Aztecs and the mythology when there were nomads. We're talking now so many years ago. There were nomads and the Aztec mythology, mythology said, you ought to walk until you find a, an eagle eating a snake on top of a cactus. Today, it's our symbol in the middle of the flag and also in our coins. This is the Aztec mythology. So they did, and they found the eagle on a cactus eating a snake in the middle of the lake. Oh my goodness, this is a huge lake. What do we do now? Well, the God said we have to start a city here. How do we do that? It's a lake. So they went like, well, let's figure it out. And they did, and they do their bare hands roots, mud, and everything, leaves, they built islands. And they built a city, the largest empire in the world back in the day, larger than any empire in Europe. And they built their own empire on a lake. When the Spaniards came, they didn't realize this is a lake. So they went like, oh, we told the queen that we would convert everybody into Catholicism, but these half naked people don't understand the language. What do we do? And they said, I have an idea. There's a main temple. Isn't this a main temple? Yes. Let's build a cathedral on top of the main temple so that these guys understand to pray in this church and not in the pyramid. So they did. They built a huge cathedral on top of our pyramid. They even stole our stone from the pyramid to build their church. Guess what happens? Since the Spaniards didn't realize there was water underneath, whole downtown Mexico is sinking. So whenever you come to Mexico, I can show you the big cathedral, the main temple to the Aztecs underneath, and the water! <coughs> <laughs> Just come, and I'll show you. Tim Portanelli has been, I've taken him. Right, Tim, are you there? 
if Tim is still there, I'm sure I, I, I know it's so funny. I, I, I would love to go to see some of those sites with you because I have a hard time. Like when I go to some of the cathedrals and I, you know, because I lived in Spain and Italy and, and, and I, I've been to all these churches. I just, I got to the point where I was like, I cannot go into one more church. I am done. I have seen There's enough a churches. Story behind every one of this. If you go to a Mexican site of pyramids, because people go like pyramids in Mexico, that's not Egypt. But we have the most ancient and beautiful places like Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan itself translated, it's called the place where men turn into God. That's how beautiful the place is that you think people are gonna turn into gods. But if you go there on your own as a foreigner and you go to the pyramids, for example, you see a bunch of stones. What are these? You know how boring. But there's I love the pyramids to tell you that this is the meaning of that, such a thing, whether the serpent and the Quetzalcoatl god, whether this and that, how incredible it is to hear the echo when the priest would stand in the middle of this open place. How did they figure out echo for everybody to listen? It was an amazing architecture. It was all uh, based on the stars and everything, but that's, it needs to be someone to explain. If you go there and see a bunch of stones, you go like, what the world, you know? Well, it's, it's, what's interesting to me is not necessarily like the, the pyramids I love. Like I've been to a bunch of different, you know, archeological sites. It's when there are the churches that are built on the back of the Aztecs or the Incans or the Mayans. And you can feel in, I have been in those churches and you can, there is like a, um, I don't know how to explain it. It's just like an energy of oppression, you know, that it was like the, 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 these people were forced to build these churches to gods that were not their God and it was all a lie and they had to do it anyhow you know what i mean because of slavery or whatever but it's just you can you can you can almost feel it and i think it, it changes it varies from church to church but there are places where you can just feel that heaviness i think you know what i i don't know if i explained myself well but yes, you probably totally totally but the architecture in mexico is is is, is such so crazy combined like you have the most amazing architects in Mexico that have, influ that have influenced your American architects like Louis Kahn, just right, right there in San Diego, the Salk Institute. It's an amazing story when Salk said, when he got sponsored for the vaccine that he had made for the, for the, como se dice, Nina, como se dice, ah, the polio, the polio, the polio. vaccine invented Salk. So the, the, American government gave him a whole bunch of money to build an institute. So he wanted the best architect, and the best architect was Louis Kahn. Parenthesis, one of the sons, the children of Louis Kahn, made a documentary called My Father the Architect. He was a terrible father, but he was a very nice architect. Anyway, you go there and you see the influence that Louis Kahn, who really stated it, as influence of Albarragan, Albarragan, a Mexican architect who was huge, influenced the architectural school all over the world, in, including in Japan, Tadao and Do, you know, the concrete things and the, but not only that, this very beautiful story is that uh, Salt told Louis Kahn, I want this place to be so beautiful that even Picasso wants to come and see it for himself. So he did build it and it's beautiful with the influence of Paragon, yes. And guess what happens later? Hi. History gossip is very nice. Later in the day, the last woman, Gilo, the last woman for Picasso, Gilo, she married Louis Kahn. No, she married uh, Salk. Imagine from the Salk Institute, he's, he married a Gilo woman who is now in charge of painting these amazing posters for the Santiago Sinfonica to perform at the Salk Institute built by Louis Kahn, influenced by Barragan, our architect. It's all a web. It's all a web. More in arts than in anything else, because it's a whole spirit, you know? It's, it's a true. Whole movement. And a bunch of movements like this, oh, we were going with, with uh, Diego Rivera and whatever came, happened with his family. But, you were asking about my father before, and I mentioned the 
See, you, yeah, you, you, you talked about him for about a millisecond. See. Then but. when my, my grandfather didn't like uh, uh, America all that much, he was very strict and he thought perhaps the Americans were a little loose. It was a very conservative family. So they traveled mostly to Europe, also to Asia, see, and Israel and blah. But when they went to the Estados Unidos, they went to Denver, Colorado. And in Colorado, there's an award called Mr. Amigo. So my father in the 70s earned the Mr. Amigo Award in Denver, Colorado. The big Sinfonica performed and my father conducted the Denver Sinfonica. So Mr. Amigo in the United States too. Well, going back to what other part were you asking? Because I got all confused with you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we talk. We you're confusing me, Melissa, por favor. I know. Lo siento, pero es que it's que todo está mezclado. Um, okay, so we talked about your we. I feel like we didn't follow through on all of the arts that are going on, like within your family, like your own, like your 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 family right now, like your brothers, like like tell it. And and I know that some of your family's watching. So you have to make sure that you mention all of them. Because if you don't, you're in trouble. <laughs> I know. So I have a... a and they're very handsome. I'm just going to say right now, everybody that's related to Patricia, like, oh my. <laughs> See, I have a, an elder sister who's very bright. And, and she started, studied in, in Mexico and then in Germany in literature. Uh, she started developing a lot in San Miguel, uh, but not too much, just enough to develop her. And uh, she's married to this wonderful chef, uh, Armando Prats, who's a very famous chef, uh, not only in Mexico, but also abroad. He makes weddings in Florencia. Then he goes to the Islas Mauricio in Greece and cooks over there. Then a lot of times he gets hired in India and blah, blah. So when they go and say, there's a pandemic going on around the world, what do you do now? Do you stay home or you just move to your sister's house who's married to a wonderful chef? You are brilliant. <laughs> you are brilliant. <laughs> These people are calling, can I have delivery, blah, blah, blah. I don't even ask for anything. All of a sudden, I get served all these incredible appetizers and meals like never before. It's like I'm in an event every day. Imagine how dramatic this is that I don't know if I should thank my sister and my brother-in-law, the chef, the famous chef, or if, if I should pitch back because I'm gaining so much weight, too much food. Not you just need to you need to get out. I, I I've you know I've been up and down those hills in San Miguel. Like there's like there's opportunities to like burn some hefty calories. Didn't you say aren't you like outside? You're outside the city though, right? Kind of by a golf course. Yes, we're in a suburb out right outside San Miguel, which is almost within San Miguel. Uh, and we we love it uh, right here a little not uh, when when the tourism comes in that we don't bitch about them because it's a money drop that the country needs because we're still an emergent economy uh, it's very nice that the tourists come but we don't need to mingle with them or whatever so we are in the in a suburb next to a golf course yes outside outside San Miguel but and oh oh my wait and that reminds me we have to tell everybody what happened so. This morning, I get a message from Patricia. She's like, you're not going to believe what happened. And I'm like, "I, it's you, Patricia. So anything is possible, right? Anything could have happened. Like, oh, there's a blackout, a total blackout. We have no power. So yesterday, when, when my brothers are asking, ah, I never finished my siblings. Let me go back to that. Oh, right. Okay, do all your, yeah, go through all your siblings because we want to make sure everybody gets credit. Everybody gets credit. So after my beautiful sister, Gisela, who's very smart and very, uh, how do you call the people that read a lot? Like bookworms. Bookworms, she's a big bookworm, but she's very beautiful. And she was almost in every commercial in Mexico and abroad as well, because she's really like a, a model. Uh, she's our eldest sister. And she's married with this incredible international chef, who's Mexican. And then we have Antonio, my brother, who's a writer and director. Uh, he is very handsome as well. 
and he doesn't like acting, although a lot of times he's requested to be an actor because he has this mean face. <laughs> he has so, a mean face. Sorry, I Antonio. Know, like people love your mean face. Are they my two oh, remember the Trotsky got killed in Mexico? I told you the Spaniard stabbed him because of uh, Stalin and Cicado story a while ago. Uh, uh, Salma Hayek made the film Frida and yeah. guess who stabs Strutsky in the movie? Antonio, my brother. <laughs> I have to rewatch that movie. I have to watch it for your brother. He says he's not an actor and he hates to stab people in the movies. <laughs> but they he they always ask him because he, he has his face and the structure. Like I was telling you about Bardem. He's the one that puts before night falls. He puts Bardem into jail for the movie Before Night Falls. And then you have Victor, my brother, who's also a producer. Uh, he produces more independent movies, uh, but he also, um, well, I cannot tell you the rest of the secrets of him because what is the difference between the Italian mafia and the Mexican mafia? The Italian mafia makes you an offer you cannot reveal. And Mexican mafia makes you an offer you cannot understand. So <laughs> I don't understand why I cannot say that Victor, my brother, is a great developer and he has several uh, incredible apartments downtown Mexico City, uh, but he's a producer. This is a side uh, business. Then you have Eric. Eric is, you met Eric perhaps. He's a genius, actor, so. but he's an amazing photographer as well. So Eric is a photographer actor, lives in San Miguel. And then you have France who has a post-production company. They also produce uh, shorts and movies and all, but mainly they uh, post-produce. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's, that's what I used to do when I was in advertising. That's what I did. I ran post-production companies and worked with film editors, which is how I met Joy Carson and how I met Tim Panarelli mm -hmm. and how I then met you and aquí estamos aquí estamos One, this is very crazy because sometimes people call you and you don't know from what part of the world they are like one day if my friend marqueta from prague might might be watching my friend marqueta producer in the czech republic calls me up one day years ago and says hey, are you patricia zavala and i went like it depends <laughs> <laughs> who wants to know who wants to know He's calling and then we're calling from the Czech Republic. We want to shoot a, a TV show in Mexico. Can you produce? And I went like, can I see the script and whatever? When I read the script, I went like, oh, no, you don't have to come all the way to Mexico. I'll get you a studio in Frankfurt. You can shoot this in the inside. What do you mean? And I go like, well, it doesn't show Mexico. I can take you to the Caribbean and we can shoot this and this. Do you mind if I write some additional things and ideas on your script? And she went like, okay, and the director went okay as well. So they come. Milan Chadima, this amazing photographer from the Czech Republic, very famous, uh, comes also. And what are we shooting tomorrow? Like, for example, we're shooting down in, in, in the Caribbean in Mexico. So we want to see the sunrise. Of course we got a sunrise. We got to leave at four in the morning. They go like, what do you mean? The sun sets up earlier in Mexico, uh, sunrise is earlier in Mexico. I said, no, we have to prep. We have the whole team, the cameras, and the whole spiel. So we got to go early. So we go there. Milan Chadima is an amazing photographer laying down on his back, the camera looking up in the sunrise. We don't understand. The whole crew needs to lay down on, their, on, their, on the floor, very cold, although it's a tropics, but at this time of day, and then you see the sun coming up on top of the camera, amazing. And then all these birds flying on top of the, screaming, ah, 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 as the sun is there. <gasps> cut, he says, okay, we cut. And then he says, Patricia, si senor, can we do it again? <laughs> and I tell him, of course, we can do this tomorrow again, same time. He says, no, 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 the, the birds part. And I go like, what are you talking about? I'm from Mexico City. I'm an asphalt flower. Where am I going to get the stupid birds from? <whistles> Just like the sheep in the other story. How, are, how am I going to do this? You know, I can't. So guess what I do? Okay, senor, grab the camera and I'll get you the birds. I have no idea where I'm going to get the, the birds from. How, yeah, how are you going to get the birds? In Mexico, you never say no. Even if you are 
pregnant several times. We never say no. That's why we have so many children in this country because we never say no. So I said, of course, senor. And I started walking on the on the on the limits of the ocean by the Caribbean. And I'm looking for the stupid birds. Where am I gonna get the birds from? I'm from Mexico City. I saw flower. And then I see in the back a little Mayan, the fellow. He is fishing and he has all these birds on top of him. And I need his birds now. So I need his birds. And I say, Senor, what are you fishing? And he gives me this freaking Maya name. And I said, well, in real life, I don't give a damn. So just take some of your fish, put them in this bucket, and come with me. I'm going to pay you a lot of money. He goes like, no, I have to fish. No, 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 Senor. We're going to fish a scene. Come with me. He, he doesn't understand anything. He doesn't understand anything. Neither do I, to tell you the truth. So we go there, and there's Milan Chadima with the camera ready, facing us towards, and the whole crew lying on the floor, waiting for the birds. And I go like, little Mayan amigo, what's your name? Pedro. Okay, Pedro, grab one of your little fish. Put them on top of the lens. And he does. And then we wait. And then the whole bunch of birds on top of the lens. And I say, Senor Milan, are you ready? Whenever you're ready, we are. We are. Just take your hand off. Action. One more, Senor Milan. Pedro, take another fish. Birds, move in. Move your hand away. You got the birds. Another one, Senor Chadima. Yes, another bird. Another fish, Pedro. And Pedro does it over and over again until we have like 20 shots with amazing birds. Better than the first one. <coughs> yes. You are crazy because what's so funny is... It you have these like really cockamamie schemes, like these, 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 these like crazy, these like crazy ideas. And they always, like, they always work out. It's just- we never it, say no. We were not raised to say no in this country. Yeah, but you figure you, you also, I think you like that because you like the challenge of it. You're like, okay, how am I gonna make this happen? And then it's literally, it's like, it's like magic. It's so magic how it happens. <laughs> but wait a second, we continue with the shoot and then we go to this incredible ranch. It's almost virgin. It's only jungles and white sand and the beautiful ocean. We're gonna shoot a, a Czech girl on top of a, an incredible white horse by the ocean, almost like Lady Godiva right there on the horse. As we're walking there, I explained to the production, to the Czech production, we cannot go all the way with the van over there. We have to carry the whole gear because it's the jungles and little paths. So I hire a bunch of Mayan uh, help to help us carry the whole thing over there because they're the locals and they know better. So we're all carrying Czechs, Mexicans, Mayans, everybody's carrying gear over and Milan Chadima stop all of a sudden. The photographer, you're killing me. What are you looking at now? And he sees a little crap crawling into a hole. And, I, and he says, what was that? I go like a crab running into a hole. This is heavy. Can we please continue? And he says, no, 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 no. I want to shoot this. Can we shoot this? And I go like, you're killing me already. What are you doing? I, when do I get the crabs and the holes and the things? But I have to say, I'm Mexican. I say, of course you can. Just put your camera set up and I'll get you the crabs. So I make a thing back with the entire, uh, freaking Mayans, and I say, Senores, do you eat these scraps? Of course we eat these scraps. How do you cook them or how do you prepare? And then you're starting to tell me all that recipe. We cut the onion, we cut the tomato, we cut the chili, and I say, no, senor, how do you get them out of the shell? And they go like, we just, a little heat on top of their thing, and then they go out of the shell, and then they, and then we put a machete, and then we fry them with the tomato and the chili. Oh, how very nice. Okay, now hunting time. Go get some crabs with this bucket and get me a bunch of them. So they do. Meanwhile, Milan Chadima is setting up the camera again by the floor. Here's the hole on the white sand. And he's ready. The whole crew is laying on their stomachs again. And here I am with the little Mayans coming back. And I say, Senor Chadima, are you ready? See. Si. So I take my lighter and I take one of the crabs and I put a little heat on their on the shell. And they start running and I put them on the floor and they start crawling into the hole. You want another one, Mr. Chadima? Yes, here's another one. And then another one. Are you ready, Senor Chadima? Here you got all the crabs in the world. So he has the most beautiful scenes of crabs running into the hole to escape from the heat of my lighter. So did the birds 
did the birds and the crabs that all happened on the same day all on the same day oh same. my god that is hilarious you know who you need to meet you need to meet, meet my i last week i interviewed my friend ramon he's an actor in in spain in madrid you would love him and he is so guapo so oh, we so also, amazing and so talented we we have we have a lot of spanish actors shipping team for our productions all the time who do so, know you, ramon so ramon and patricia i'm going to okay oh wait a minute hola guapas yeah he's amazing so and he's super talented an amazing dancer an amazing he's just he's just a really deep thinker also i'll he's if you look on the feed you can see my um uh, my interview with ramon also and oh a ver um what did he say? yeah but he's he's amazing so i have to connect you two so that you can you can bring him in for your productions sure? he's on a lot of shows in, in he's on a lot of shows in spain on netflix and everything if we can bring uh, uh, the, all the talented uh, cinematographers and, and people, of course we can bring in the talented actors as well as we have been doing already. Ramon, encantado myself. <laughs> yeah, and when you meet, he is also like, okay, when I moved to Spain, when I moved to Madrid in the 90s, I, um, you know, I had, I have blonde hair and blue eyes and everything. And I got there and people, especially in the nineties, they were always like shouting at me and, and everything. And so I was a little bit goth also. So I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to just dye my hair black. I always wanted to dye my hair black. You're and so beautiful with your blonde hair, come on. It was, okay, so, and so I've got pictures of Ramon and I, and I've got this horrible black hair. I, I mean, I get it. I liked The Cure. I liked Depeche. I like Sisters of Mercy. I like all these like goth bands. So I thought, okay, I'll dye my hair black and then I'll blend in. And so it worked out because they stopped thinking that I was American and they started to think that I was Irish. So it worked a little bit. But anyhow, I started to say it because in Spain, the women at my salon were like, are you crazy? Like everybody wants to have blonde hair and blue eyes. And wow. you, you. You, you, it was almost like heresy. It was like a sin that I was taking my blonde hair and dyeing it black. But I, I, what I'm trying to get at here is that with Ramon, he has the most beautiful blonde hair and blue eyes. And he is like Spaniard, Spaniard, but you would never like, people would always, say oh you look kind of like david bowie or you look german or you look but he's he's like one of those rare like rare people that's uh that's like a oh ramon's laughing he's like yeah <laughs> it's true yeah because everybody would be like oh david bowie you're like david bowie and, yeah so you'll have to um we'll have to we'll have to do an import export with um ramon but if you shoot with ramon in mexico um i i have to be there that's all i'm saying you brought up this whole bunch of of Spaniards one time and I brought them to this restaurant and they were eating and, and we had the pozole and they were having to have to put the salad in the radish and whatever you prepare. And the Spaniards went like, why don't they, doesn't the chef cook it all for us? Why do we have to cook on the table? And I said, no, it's just a garnish, it's been cooked. Just try it. Next day we take them to the tacos. And again, he has to put the onion, the salsa, the lime. And he goes like, Patricia, you have to come to Spain. Imagine, you sit in a restaurant, you even get a spoon. You don't have to eat with your hands. And everything is being cooked for. <laughs> he was laughing at the Mexican cuisine. He didn't ever understood that we are garnishing our dishes only. <laughs> it's world heritage. Mexican cuisine is world heritage. It is, oh my gosh, the food in the food in Mexico is so good. And actually in San Miguel, we ate amazing food every day. What's the name of that? Um, there's that Peruvian restaurant too that we went to. Easy. I can't remember what the name of it was, but it wasn't just like there was amazing Mexican food, but it was there was also like a global. Chips. How can we forget? We go there all the time. La parada. La parada. Mm -hmm. Close to my brother's Antonio's house, yes, La Parada is amazing food. And in the corner, Antonio Banderas used to stay there at Casa Liza. He would stay there when we were shooting here. And then he never wanted to move. So it was an incredible there uh, story that I cannot tell you right now. Ah, La Parada is amazing, uh, Peruvian uh, ceviches and everything, yes. We have international cuisine here in San Miguel. I mean, not everybody has to eat the Mexican cuisine every day. Like when Johnny Depp was in town. 
and I said, Senor Depp, are you going out for dinner tonight? So I knew whether I should wrap the security or not. He said, no, no, I'm going to eat from home. Okay, whatever. Next thing you know, he didn't know that everybody knows me in this town. And the guy from the market bistro calls and says, Patricia, I have your actor right here eating a big salad. Can you pass me to him? Senor Depp, what are you doing? And he said, no, no, I just wanted a quick salad. I don't need the whole entourage. Please, Patricia, don't tell anybody. He did it. <laughs> but he was eating out and loving the, the, the cuisine here, as did uh, uh, William Dafoe. The William Dafoe agent was so funny because she called and says, we need William Dafoe to stay at the Four Seasons. We were shooting once upon a time in Mexico. And I said, Senora, the Four Seasons is in Mexico City. We are in San Miguel. But we have a wonderful lodging for him. Don't worry. No, no, you don't seem to understand. Uh, William Dafoe wants to stay at the Four Seasons. Si, senora, but the Four Seasons is five hours away from here. You don't seem to understand, but we have much better hotels in the Four Seasons around here. No, 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 no. We want the Four Seasons. Jesus. Make them understand that Mexico is a whole country, not just a city. But anyways, yes, the very magnificent. And then you saw the beautiful sunset by, by the jazz band as we were overlooking the whole city on the sunset. Oh, no. What's the name? Of, what was the name of that hotel? It was a Rosewood Hotel. It was so beautiful. That's where that's where I had my first carajillo. And I'm kind of out. I think I'm going to, I think while we're, while we're talking, I keep going in and out of the sun because the sun is coming in. It's a beautiful day here in Chicago. The sun's coming in, but I think I need another carajillo. So I need to text my chef and say, hey, babe, make me another carajillo, por favor. You know what? I don't know what to do because if I have too much carajillo, too many carajillos, then I don't sleep. I don't sleep anyways. So... You know, oh, that's right. You don't have a descafeinado. I did, but still, usually when I order a descafeinado, I always say, Senor waiter, uh, please give me a tic of carajillo and your phone number. And he goes, oh, what? And I say, if somebody's not going to sleep, it's not only going to be me. I will call you all night saying, it was not tic of, it was not tic of, it was not tic of. You know, it's not there. I, and you know what? That is so true. You 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 cannot always trust that it's going to be and and because it could have it's supposed to. I don't know if they do this in Mexico. Here they have like an orange. The coffee is has an is an orange pot, or it's got just a different color so that you know that there's no caffeine. But mm -hmm. that's not always true here, man. Somebody might give you the caffeinated, and then you're in trouble. You are up. Yes, I saw this American guy sitting at the restaurant, and and he said. Can I have a coffee? And the waiter went, a Mexican waiter went Americano, and he said, why, is that a problem? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, but we do more French press and such, you know? And when they do that with the Italian or the French press, then you never know what they're giving you, you know? Or no, they you come with the thing already prepared, and then you're stuck all night like owl. Uh, but uh, my chef here is putting me some Modelo Cerveza. Oh, I'm not supposed to say the trademark. <laughs> I was going to say Corona, but everybody's scared of the Corona beer. So I'm saying Modelo, so nobody's scared. What's that, <laughs> Melissa? Please tell me. Well, you know what's so funny is I could not drink. Oh, look at that. That's a beautiful beer. Maybe I'll get one. Um, I'm going to, that's what I'll say to Kenny. I'll say, una cerveza, por favor. Exactamente. Uh huh. Because I I stopped drinking beer, but then because so I went to Me I went to Mexico twice with Joy, and the first time we went to Merida, and when we were in Merida, I I love tequila, right? So I was trying to keep up with Joy. It was so hot. It was so hot, and I was trying to keep up with her drinking. But every time she ordered, a she doesn't drink anything. She drinks up the, uh, a cocktail and she's done. She hardly yeah. drinks. No, but no, but she, but we would, she would sip on a beer and then I would be sipping on margaritas. And every time she got a beer, I would get a margarita. That is not, or just straight up tequila. That's not equal. I know they say it's equal, but you can't, I can't drink as much tequila as beer, right? So I ended up, it was in Mexico. That's where I started drinking beer again, just with a lot of lime. I love yes. beer with lime. Yes. It's the best thing is a michelada. When you have salt on the rim and you yes. put some lime inside, ice, and then your cerveza. Very nice. My German grandmother used to come and taste it after golfing. 
And she would go like, what are you doing to the beer, man? Why are you putting salt and lime in the beer? Why are you stupid? It tastes like capis. Next thing you know, next day we play golf. And after golf, she goes like, what is the thing that you were having yesterday? Can I order one? Aha. It's much more refreshing than only the Pilsner. Yeah. It is. That little lime, it just gives it that kick. The lime and the salt. It's the same thing with papaya. Like when I have papaya in the morning, I always have to put lots of lime and a little bit of salt. Nice. We so do good. A tajin, you know the powder, the chili powder? Oh, yeah. That is mm -hmm. an amazing thing. If you put a little chili, and chili is very nice and very good for you. It has a lot of vitamin C more than anything. Oh, I didn't even know that. Vitamin yeah. C in chili? Chile has lots of vitamin C. It's amazing. You know, when I was little, my father used to force me to, to try the chile so I would learn to eat it because it was very important for my health to have chile. If you have chile, it has more vitamin C than anything you know. So when I'm trying to picture like a little kid, you as a little as a little kid with your dad force feeding you chili. Like, I know. He said, smell it first. And I said, mm, I don't like it. Smell it again. I still don't like it. Try it again. So I learned that you have to teach everybody to try it three times before you say no. Before you say no, you try it three times. The first time you try it, you, it's a weird flavor. You don't like it. The second time you try it, because everybody else said it's delicious, you're going to say, I don't like it. I don't like it. The third time, you're completely objective. So I learned my children how to do this, and they can eat anything. The weird Turkish uh, yogurt, the, the freaking uh, crazy fish over there in Spain, whatever. And they eat everything because they taste it three times. That's that's actually a pretty good that's that's pretty good. there are certain things though that I just can't eat. Like I don't like oysters. I don't like like the like raw oysters, like the 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 texture of the oysters. I don't think I would mind like the flavor. I like scallops, I like clams, wow. I like I like shrimp, I like all sorts of, of shellfish. But when it comes to oysters, it's I just you know what? Well, eh, Nina Está eh, metiéndose un letrero del Apple ID, pues no sé. Eh, guess what? When, when you are tasting the scallop and everything that you mentioned just now, and you cut it small and you make a big ceviche out of it. Ouch! Ouch! Look what, what I have. have? What I have a little. Inside? It's it's, um, it's a Miller High Life, so they call this they call this the champagne of beers. This is this is the sham the champagne of beers. With a little lime. What's a nice bottle right there? Yeah. Oye, the champagne. You know what? Uh, the limes in the States I love, but it's the yellow kind. We don't have them here. What kind do you have right there? Well, we have you so we have the lemons, but then we have we have we have little limes too. Sometimes you have to be careful to get you want like a juicy, you want a nice juicy lime. Sometimes they, they dry out pretty quickly. And you know what we do down here, as I told you when you were down, we do the nail and the hammer. What's the nail and the hammer? You have a little tequila zip, and then you have your little beer. Oh, yeah. Let me tell our friends that are not Mexican the story of how to drink the tequila. Okay. You know what? Usually, when we have Americans coming visit, they all shoot the tequila, and then they lick the line. Let me tell you a story. This is how it works. Back in the day, talking about Spaniards, when we still belonged to the crown of Spain, we were not allowed to produce any kind of liquor or alcohol. Everything was brought in with ships, mostly red wine, of course. Gracias. Mostly red wine. So we were producing for centuries already the pulque, the tequila, the mezcal. We were doing this forever. So when they were converting us, well, some patrons, the Spanish patrons at the big haciendas, would say, I allow them to have whatever stupid liquor from Acactasia to drink as long as they go to mass. On a Sunday, we were allowed to have a little whatever drink we were having that was made in Mexico, and the Spaniards don't even care about our stupid, uh, uh, terrible drink made out of Acactasia. So in this hacienda, in the state of Jalisco, this guy, the wife had passed away, the children were all gone, and he's sitting at his huge mansion, the hacienda, and all of his workers went to church, all of the indios, and they were having a little tequila, and they were zipping on it. 
And they were all dancing and they were all very happy. And this lonely patron, the Spaniard, sitting out in his hacienda. So he said, Oye, Pancho, what are you drinking there? And he said, We're having tequila, patron. Can I have some? And they were all scared because the process back in the day was not as pure as today. It was a very raw and it could damage the throat of the patron. And if it would damage the patron, he would get whips. So what do we do? Oh, bring in some salt, thick salt, oranges, and limes. And they ask the patron to lick it first. Keep it in his mouth. Water his mouth. And then zip the tequila. Because of the saliva and the, and the sourness, it goes smoothly down. So if you're going to drink the tequila, you don't shoot it because el tequila se vive, no se bebe. No claro. My my sister my sister in law Rita, who I don't know that she's watching right now or not, but regardless, we drink a lot of Patron together. And um, but I, I I do not like to do shots. I like to Ooh. sip it. It's so good. It what tastes so good. Friends? Why would you want to shoot it? Then you don't have to buy an expensive tequila. You can buy any sort, whatever is the cheapest at the market. You have to know what you're drinking. You have to keep it in your mouth for a few seconds and then swallow it softly. And then if you're going to use a lime, which is not really a very, uh, how do you say, it's not well seen in Mexico. You don't lick the lime. You just zip the tequila and smoothly let it down, keep it in your mouth for a while, and then swallow it. That's how you live the tequila. You just don't shoot it like that. Yeah, it's like smoking a joint, right? Like you, you just you, you don't like take a huge puff. But what's what's interesting though is that that reminds me of like in Chicago, hot dogs. You can't put if you eat a hot dog in Chicago, it's you cannot put ketchup on it. It's like very poorly seen. It's like not pro it's not proper. You can have mustard on a hot dog but you cannot put ketchup on a hot dog. So ketchup on a hot dog in Chicago is like lime with tequila and, uh, and Is that because of the, of the Polish heritage that you have in Chicago perhaps? It's possible, it's possible. I feel like it's, but the, the thing that's so funny is because sometimes little kids, they don't wanna eat the hot dogs and the ketchup is very sweet. So when you're a little kid, you learn to eat the hot dog with the ketchup because it's sweet. And then when you grow up to be an adult, you want ketchup on your hot dog. So it's sort of, but yeah. Uh, you put the sauerkraut there, the, the crowd there on top of, no. How do you say sauerkraut? That, well, that you would do with, um, that you would do with uh, Polish sausage. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. You would put the sauerkraut on Polish sausage or bratwurst, or I suppose you could put it on a hot dog also. We do it here, but only in our family because we're half, but usually nobody does. Uh, I tried it at Pinky's in California and it was delicious. Sauerkraut on your hot dog? Hey. Oh yeah, darling. But the Polish people in, in Chicago, they also have a Mexican heritage. Nobody knows about this story, but there's a film about it. It's called the, the Mexican Polka. It's very beautiful. Uh, you know, uh, back in the day, the, Pol the poor Polish were running from one place to the other, from the other one, they kicked out from everywhere, stealing their land, giving it back, moving them from here to there. Like, they were, like, moved everywhere. So some of them, after the Second World War, asked for asylum in America. But the American government had already all these people there. So he asked Avila Camacho, our president, back in the day, can you please take all these 60 Polish that are coming? And the Mexican president, Avila Camacho, said, what are you talking about? No, we are a poor country. We cannot feed extra 60 Polish. And he said, oh, the American government will pay you. Uh, how much do you need for to keep the Polish? And they found a big hacienda here in the state of Guanajuato, close to Leon. And they went like, uh, it's 12 pesos a month. Okay, I give you 10 years in advance. So we are so festive when we have guests, as you know. So when the Polish arrived, on the train, there was a big mariachi uh, receiving them. And these people, poor people, they were pushed out, uh, out of everywhere. And all of a sudden they get greeted like they are kings and princesses, you know? And they were also very happy. And then we put them in this hacienda. For two generations they were living here, only Polish. They married them within each other, they had children. Some of them married Mexicans. And, and they stayed there for a long time. 
uh, Roosevelt was gone, and the Mexican government, Avila Camacho, was not there anymore. And they asked the Mexican government, asked the American government, what do we do with this? Because you paid only for 10 years. What do we do now? And they said, oh, no, ask them to stay for another year there, and they should look for where to go. And their original task was to go all the way to the States. So they moved to Chicago. And they... The, the beginning of the Polish community in Chicago was coming straight from the state of Guanajuato, where San Miguel is at. What is the coincidence, amiga? That is crazy. Oh, well, and, and uh, you know, it's a small world. It's totally a small world. And you know Kenny is 100% Polish. Kenny is 100% Polish, yeah. And then I, um, our neighborhood that we live in is Polish. So uh, when I go to the bank, all of the women, everybody in my bank speaks Polish. When I go to one of the grocery stores, they're all speaking Polish there. And a lot of times they'll just talk to me in Polish. But I don't, you know, I don't understand. All I'm telling you about is not only on Wikipedia, it's not only on Wikipedia, but also uh, this guy who's a grandson of the original guys that went to Chicago made a short movie that was shown at the Polish embassy we all went to and he makes the stories interviewing all these guys in the documentary about where do you come from straight from Poland no we made a, a 10 year stop in Mexico blah 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 all this story I'm telling you comes from a short movie not only from Wikipedia and it's Mex it's called the Mexican polka see uh can you ask Anna there on the chat if it's a uh, how is it called the Mexican polka or ask Antonio perhaps Antonio, they know the title. Well, and, and yeah, and we can always, yeah, if they're if they're on the chat, they can just put it in the chat, and then and then and then we'll see it when they put it in the chat. Let me see. I don't know if it's uh, if they're there, or we can look it up and, and put it in the chat later. ¿Cómo se llama el cortometraje de los polacos que venían de Santa Rosa, de México? And this is years ago, and this guy is the grandson, a Polish guy from Chicago, who did this movie, Antonio Yodo. I love it. See, see, we have to tell Ken about it. And Anna, the, the producer that I was telling you about, huge Mexican producer, Polish Mexican, she can, she did the, the one that did the Titanic, the Man on Fire and everything. We're very close, we're family. And, and uh, she never says she's Polish, she says she's Mexican, although she looks completely Polish. She's a beautiful woman and very smart. And uh, when we were talking about this uh, movement, she said it's unbelievable, you know, because these other Polish that came right after the Second World War, uh, not with esteem, didn't get any help or, or, you know, subsidized by any government. There's a lot of Polish that got stuck in Mexico and remained. And, and a lot of them, the ones that came first with the polka and the thing I was telling you, are the ones that went to Chicago and started the Polish community back in the day. Let me find out, uh, were you able to? No, not connecting. I will tell you a bit later. Oh, let yeah, me you can tell you can tell me later, and then I can just I can I can add it to the chat. We can put our little bibliography in the chat. See, si, we have to. But anyways, going back to 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 what brought us here. The arts and the San Miguel Allende through the arts is very impressive. We have had a lot of uh, amazing artists not only coming here and developing their own art, but from here to the world also. And, and it was so appealing that I was telling you, when Neil Cassidy come, came here, it was not just a, such a weird thing to have a, a weird uh, writer living in here and trying to have our pulque and our tequila and going to the Mexican parties and try it psychedelic drugs, you know? The Mexicans, uh, they they started selling them in the 60s. It, uh, it didn't start, I mean, when I was living in Winneta, north of you, I went to Mother's, the bar, because they had recently shot the movie about last night. About last night, love that movie, yeah. That with me there, took me out dancing, and he said, hey, do you want to dance? Back in the day, they would ask you to dance. Of course, we're not talking now ballrooms or anything, it's just a stupid bar. And as we were dancing, he says, oh, and where are you from? And I say, Mexico. And you know what he said? So pretty and Mexican, and I didn't know where to slap it in the face or say thank you, you know? But the next thing he asks, he says, and Patricia, what kind of drug do you use? And I say, 
No, you get a mistake. We don't use the drugs, we just sell them. I <laughs> <laughs> was very sad when I got married, but I wouldn't have married him anyway. So what was his point? I know that he was trying to rip his 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 veins and everything because he was very sad that I was getting married. But I was not going to marry him in the first place. Uh, did, did you contact him? Do you know the name of the movie? It's very important. <laughs> <laughs> you've got you've got your chef, you've got your producer and your researcher. I should be falling asleep right there. Oye, <laughs> oye, Armando. Listen, you got your chef right there. Let me go. My chef is falling asleep right now. No, because I'm not asking for anything. It's boring. No, you need to make a heart, make him work harder or something like that. He can't be asleep on the job. No, but you know what? He made the most amazing paella in the world. You know the Spanish dish paella? Oh my God, it's my favorite. I love paella. I know. He made, you know, for a hundred people because he just puts it on WhatsApp and everybody's going like, can I have a kilo? Can I have another kilo? He just usually doesn't sell paella by the kilo, but everybody was asking. So that was yesterday. We had the most amazing paella in the world. But not only that, even breakfast, man. He cuts the food so nicely, and then the eggs on the salsa that's boiling, and cheese on top, and the best baguettes. And then midday, he says, it's time for a cocktail, and he makes the mojitos, and we sit outside the terrace. And then he comes in and says, let's have an aperitivo, and he has all these nice little Spanish things for us to buy on. And then he prepares, and I go like, come on, stop it already. I'm choppy as it is. We all love his food. He's an amazing chef. Amazing chef. No wonder they hire him everywhere. He's amazing. And very I, I, I'm just getting, I'm getting, I'm, I'm salivating just hearing you say all of that. It's, <laughs> and the thing that must be so fun for him actually right now is there's, yeah, there's, there's problems with, everything being closed and all. But I think that when you have that opportunity to like be cooking and enjoying it with your family all day long, and then still being able to make kilos of paella and have people order them, like it's it's still, it's like a unique time, I think, for yes. creativity. It's too wonderful. Sometimes Nina and I were at home in Querétaro, in Juriquilla, next to the other golf course all over the other state, but which is very close. And all of a sudden, the van of the chef Pratt would show up with uh, tables and chairs and, and, and the, como se dice, carpas, and the tents and everything. And he would make a risotto right there. And I said, you don't need to take out these these uh, stoves, you can use mine inside. No, 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 Patricia, please, just remain inside. Don't disturb. And then he would prepare the most amazing risotto for everybody, set the tables next to the pool, and we would have the most majestic uh, food ever. On Sundays, just show up and do it just like a regular Sunday thing. It's amazing. So that's why it's very important when there's a quarantine to think twice. Be, be smart about it. Be yeah. smart about it. I know. Fine. Kenny is Kenny is an amazing cook, and I we we we're a good team because I like to come up with the ideas, and we'll brainstorm what we're going to eat. One of us will shop. I'll like be like I'm like the sous chef. I know. See, because if I if I am in control of actually cooking it. I will probably, I'm like Bridget Jones. I'll probably make like blue soup and, you know, and burn, you know, burn the bread. <laughs> My Although I'm pretty good at baking. I'm a chef. She's a sous chef as well. She, I mean, Armando has the most beautiful sous chef ever. I'm telling you, my sister is so beautiful. She's like a model. Well, she was a model. And she's a sous chef and they are both cooking. We have to step out of the kitchen. Nina and I just leave, 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 sit at the terrace, have the mojitos, and all of a sudden they come. Food is ready. Oh, the most amazing onion soup in the French. It depends. He varies. One day it's all Spanish, one day it's all French, one day it's all Mexican. I mean, we couldn't have chosen a better place to do the quarantine at. But guess what? I'm hating him already. Hating him? He's making me so chubby. <laughs> That's not sexy anymore, you know? Look, I got the paella right here and the risotto here. The paella here, the risotto here, you know, a little, a, a mojito here. I know! 
Jesus, I don't know if I should thank him or or bitch about it. <laughs> so how long, speaking of the court, how long do you think you'll be in quarantine and in San Miguel? And, and is, is it like in, in the States, what's happening is it's it's state by state. So it's not like the president that is making the rules. It's the governors in each of the states. No, is that the same in Mexico or is it different? Uh, you know, I know that the that the governors are the smart side. Uh, go, go, God bless the, your governors, man. Cuomo is doing such an amazing job. I wish he would. Almost amazing. Cuomo's Georgia, amazing. not so much. Georgia, whatever. But I know I've heard about it. Ah, but guess what? Uh, here in in San Miguel, we have. I mean, it rose from se three cases to seven. Mm. We have seven cases. We're still locked in. We've been locked in for a month. My sister has, is now your eighth week, right? No, tenth. Tenth week. My sister's tenth week. But she doesn't like people anyway. So if she's locked in for 22 years, she loves it. She hates stupid people. So she um, assumes everybody's stupid. So she prefers to remain at home. She's beautiful and smart. Anyway, deadly, deadly combination. Deadly combination. Yeah. We, have, we have seven cases in San Miguel. But we're doing the whole spiel. We're all locked in. We don't we don't even walk our dogs anymore because Armando the chef would go all paranoid cleaning the the the, the feet of the how do you call it? Eh? The paws of the dogs with chlorine and everything. And we don't know. I mean, to tell you the truth, we, we cannot trust the, the numbers that we're being fed with with our government. If we don't have enough tests, how do we know how many people are really infected, you know? Just to play it safe, we're doing the whole stay at home kind of thing, which I think it's very important. A lot of Mexicans are not really doing it, which I think it's all super sad. But I keep posting that they should. We keep talking to people and everything. But there's a lot of ignorance in the country because we are, like, you know, an emerging economy country, and not everybody had the chance to go to school and understand that this is a real pandemic that's going on, and it's not just uh, the gringos inventing this end of the world kind of thing. But, but, it's, it's, but it's true. In, in, in the U.S., though, it's the same. Not everybody is... Not not everybody is on board with things, and people are protesting and wanting wanting everybody to go back. And I'm it's so sad. Even your president going like we're reopening soon. What is he talking about, man? Everybody's dying over there. It, it's not so so very so very weird that now it seems that the states is now more dangerous than Mexico. For the first time in so many years going to America. Mexicans are stopping the Americans to come into our country by the border. I see protesters standing with their cars, stopping Americans to come in. So I know. Because people, it's not a, an act of faith whether you believe in the coronavirus or you don't. It's just a thing that's going, going on for real. And, and then I was saying, perhaps the ignorance of my country. No, no, no. Like you said, it's everywhere. This Austrian uh, what's up me last week? An Austrian living in San Miguel. Guapa, what are you doing for the weekend? Should we have some drinks? And I go like, what are you talking about? I'm locked in. There's a quarantine. There's a pandemic throughout the world. And you know what the Austrian answered? I don't believe him. He thinks he's so handsome and so stupid that he can just ask you out on, on the quarantine. What is he doing? Not even the bars are open. When Joy Carson was here, we wanted to have the, the, the sunset margaritas like we always do, and we could not. Everything should be closed, and we should be remaining at home. Stop yeah. it. If you're Austrian, gringo, Mexican, whether there's seven cases or a million cases, you stay at home already. Yeah. It's true. I yeah, and I feel like Joy got out like just in just in time before it got kind of crazy getting in and out of the airports and the flights and everything. But it's 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 interesting. It's interesting for sure. In a movie in the Dominican Republic. I took Nina because she was visiting from Germany. She's going to college in Germany. So she came for a visit and then all of a sudden I had to move to for a movie to the Dominican Republic. She came with me and as we were there after a week we were told that this is completely safe. We're surrounded by water. There's no one single case in the Dominican Republic by the Caribbean. No one goes in or out. There's no one single case. We're all safe. We're going to shoot. Next thing you know, a week later, they send us all home. Because one single Spaniard got in and we got all in. Everybody decided to get infected. It's not a fun game. We have to go home 
and remain until everything is, is good again. So I drove, remain home. Stay at home. I always wanted to stay home in the first place. Now you have it. Stay home already. <laughs> It's so, it's, it's, it's so funny. It, 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 yeah, it's just an interesting, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing, but that's what got this whole thing started because I started thinking about all of my friends and people that I miss and people that are amazing. And I thought, you know, if I could have the opportunity to just like hang out with Patricia and other people can, can like hang out with us. Like we're hanging out in a cafe for hours, whatever, like, why not? Porque no. We could do it online like we're doing just now. People can talk to us. Look, what are they saying? We don't there even know. Lots of people are laughing. Like half of the comments are people laughing because you're so freaking funny. So I, I'm going to do, you are so funny. So I'm going to do a, a, a timeout and say, hey, people that are at Mimi's Global Cafe right now, if you have any questions about mm, pretty much anything, it could be a Jeopardy question. If Patricia does not know the answer. I can guarantee you she will make something up. And you that. will believe it. I would do you know the game, Patricia? Do you know the game Balderdash? No, I know Jeopardy. And I know when people are thinking, you have to go in the background going. But you would kill at Balderdash, because with Balderdash, you have to make things up. And then people have to figure out what is true and what's a lie. And you are so good at laying things out that you could make anybody, you could you sell are at telling lies. You were about to say that. <laughs> I almost called you Manta Rosa. No, but what I was going to say is you could sell ice to Eskimos. You're one of those people. <laughs> sell the ice to the Eskimos. Oh, yeah, Mira. If anybody has a doubt or a question about what we have been talking about, because we've been talking about a whole bunch, we've been talking about 300 centuries of art. If anybody has a question, they should ask right now or shush forever. Ah, no, it's true. Uh, no, but on that, you're totally like, you know, you like, you so know your stuff. Like, you know, everything about that. So, no, I, I'm not saying that you've made up any stories about that. I'm just saying if people had other questions that you couldn't answer, you would gladly make something up. I gladly would make something up that would sound completely normal. And then in the end, you would go Wikipedia and see that what I was saying was true. You, that's it. You are basically like a walking, you're, um, how would you say it? Patriciapedia. Patricia no, they really for real call me Wikipati. Wiki Patty. <laughs> Wiki Patty. If you don't know the answer, you make it up anyway. Uh, my sister says, if you don't know the answer, you make it up anyway. <laughs> es igual. That's exactly what I just said. It is so true. We can make up stories. What are they doing in their homes anyway? Figuring out things, and we can figure out them together. Let's have a mini cafe together. That's right. We can we can solve we can solve it all. What what are those? There are birds um, singing in the background. Do you know what kind of birds those are? Oh, we have a lot of birds around here because there. Oh, we have free birds everywhere because we have green and it's springtime in San Miguel. It's the eternal spring. We have. Springtime and there's a lot of birds all the time. Sometimes I even get upset at the birds. I cannot tell a story in the mornings for breakfast because the stupid birds are screaming and I go like, are you going to tell the story now? Is that what you're saying? Are you going to tell the story? Because they start screaming. They don't like my voice. It's a German heritage tone of voice. It's not a German heritage tone of voice. Yes, because all the Latinas have a high voice. They all talk like this. And me, I go like, we have a mining coffee in Berlin. <laughs> That's Tim Portanelli song. I love him. You know who that was, you know? When the, when, the, when the Nazis had all this talent and the American Hollywood uh, industry was bringing in all these uh, talents from Germany. We have a good question. We have a question from Karen in yeah. New Mexico. And she says, when I was teaching art after school, Frida Kahlo, the students in elementary school asked if she appeared sad in her portraits because she was in pain from her accident. What do you think about that? I have to tell you a little story about Frida, Karen. 
Frida originally is half German, just like Mimi and me. So she has a German heritage, a German father with a half India woman, uh, and she was very proud of her heritage. But Frida had this terrible accident, of course, and she was really very sad, but not always. When she was a student, going back at four, fourth from school, in the beginnings, I never told you this, Diego Rivera was painting at the Secretaría de Educación Pública, how do you say this? The Ministry of Education. He got mm -hmm. hired to paint the mural, a big mural, because in the beginning, of course, back in the day, uh, mainly all the population in Mexico, a whole bunch, was illiterate. So through the painting, they would learn history. So Diego Rivera was painting, and Frida Kahlo was going back from high school, passing where the chubby guy was painting in the, the freaking walls. He was already married, so to say, to Lupe. Dos veces únicas, there's a book about her. But regardless, it, she's the one that, that is a mother to two of the, of the three children of Diego. Two of the three children, two women. Anyway, uh, the, uh, Frida Kahlo would pass, a, pass there and she fell in love, not with the guy, but with his art. And she was amazed by it and she wanted to paint. Diego Rivera always said, you're not a good painter, you're this and that and whatever. She was a little student with a big eyebrows. I'm sorry, perhaps half German Mexicans I have big eyebrows. Uh, and anyways, he would fall in love with the guy, although he was a very terrible guy, you know? And to tell you the truth, Diego Rivera was a not nice guy. He would sleep around with every model ever. I don't know how he got to sleep with Greta Garbo and the big ones when he painted the, 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 their portraits. He would sleep with all of these women. And when, when you see the Weinstein movie with, with uh, uh, Frida, uh, Salma Hayek being Frida, and, 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 and her, this is a true story. When, when Frida was making a, a basket for his lunch and brought him to the studio and, and, and didn't want to interrupt and saw the amazing architecture of, of, of a, um, como se dice, Bauhaus architecture, uh -huh. because he was very into the Russian thing. And, and then the whole movement of the Bauhaus was in real life to make it smaller and with no details and things. So she would look through the window and saw her own sister sleeping with him. It was terrible. But not only did Frida see this, also Lupe Marin, the first wife, saw this. You know, he was sleeping around with every woman ever, as if he would have been beautiful. They called him the frog because he was so ugly. I mean, his heart was amazing, but he was not a nice human being with women, you know. He was a sort of misogynist, sleeping around everybody. All the girls he slept with, it's amazing. How did all these women, and they interviewed him. They interviewed him in New York. How do you manage to sleep with all these beautiful Hollywood actresses anyway? Like going like, look at you, hmm? look at you and look at Greta Garbo. Hmm? Hmm? And you know what he said? You know what the macho guy said? Diego Rivera answered. The only thing to be seductive is, as a guy is to listen to them. Pretend that you're paying attention to what they are saying and bring you that. That is one of the things Diego Rivera said about women. Just listen to them and they will fall in love with you. Can you believe him? Okay, yes. But Patricia, there is a kernel of truth to that because there are so many dudes that, you know, I, I mean, Kenny is amazing. Kenny is wonderful. I've dated dudes. I've dated, there, there are so many guys out there that all they want to do, I love you, men. I love men. It's all good. But there's a lot of men out there that all they want to do is talk about themselves, right? And they don't want to listen. So he was on to something, you know, he, you know, Diego listening to women, the fact that he was using it to manipulate them Que cabron. He's, he's an ass. He's, he's, he's an asshole for doing that. But if somebody actually really listened to somebody, of course, because, and especially in Mexico, you have a man that's going to sit there and listen to you. You're not used to that. You're used to men telling you what to do. So he was, he tenia razón, eh? Well, but I don't know. I, I would like to say that I would not fall for it. And it's but maybe really, I would. Maybe I would. Frida was such a smart woman. 
You know, she made all these changes and the big feminist movements and things, you know, when Diego didn't believe in her, when, when she said, that's it. You know what Frida did to get back at him? She went back to the States and slept with every single lover he had slept with, even women. So everybody thinks in history that perhaps Frida was gay. No, she was just getting back at the bastard. Did you sleep with this incredible actress? Because what I did too. And then it was totally he, revenge. It was revenge sex. And then Diego he responded and said, what's going on? Let's get back together. Imagine how desperate he was. And then they remarried. And then Frida got all into Vogue magazines and all, you know, the, 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 the covers of Vogue magazine back in the day. It was all about Frida and her art. And guess what it was? It was the embroidery of the Mexican. She was so proud of her Mexican heritage that it had to come out in the Vogue magazine. And it never ended. It's still there, darling. So back to Karen's original question. Yes. Do you think yes. that what? she is um, trying to, that, that in her images that she paints of herself, that she is painting like sadness or melancholy? Or do you think that that's just how she was straight up? I think, imagine, of course, the mother before Diego had put the mirror on the, on the cover of her bed because it was, yes, because she was there lying on the bed and everything. But then there's also a story because she painted it, her being pregnant and the baby and the baby and the baby. Guess what? I'm going to tell you a truth that you can look up because I'm never lying to tell you that Frida Kahlo contacted his, her Detroit gynecologist to say, I'm pregnant with Diego's child. Under my circumstances, physical circumstances, I think you should perform an abortion on me because I don't think I can give birth and raise this child. So whenever she's painting the baby that everybody thinks that she wanted to have with Diego is really how much she was feeling guilty of not having had that child. Wow. Because I, I have the letters. I mean, you can Google them. The letters of Frida Kahlo to the doctor. Please Google it so you know I'm not lying. And, and of course, there's an incredible heritage of Frida Kahlo, and there's nothing to feel guilty about if she felt that she had to have an abortion. Yeah. But when we understand her art, so we understand her state of mind. And then she tried, and she tried often again to have a child for Diego because she was feeling sad about what she had done. And she could never have it because she was so sick and it got even worse and worse and worse. But she really got rid of that baby with the American doctor. You can find it. Wow. That adds, a, that adds like a whole other level to her art. The, the point of vision, which is not bad. Yes. I mean, women can decide upon their bodies and their circumstances, of course. Because... Women, even if the population doesn't approve it or whatever, women are still going to have abortions. The one, one way to have it in a safe way or one way to have it in a different, a complicated state, uh, which is the thing that we can argue. But she was such a feminist and everything. Uh, we don't take her wrong for doing this, uh, but she really, really tried and, and, and tried over and over again to have then the child that she never could have. And she decided to with with the with the doctor. We don't need to put any um, political um, arguments on this chat, nor are we setting up any positions on religion or or this. Uh, it's just I'm just telling a fact. Yeah, no, it's the truth. It's totally the truth. And but it, it is interesting because when you stop and you think about a woman being creative, that is like the biological way that women are creative and so if that didn't come to fruition with her and diego you could see how it might have a little bit of tormenting in her art right yes. to to because that's that's that it, she could create through her art if she didn't create a child you know yes when even when trotsky came to mexico and, and she was hiding in, in frida's house at the closet i was telling you about with a little curtain uh, he was hiding in there from Stalin. He was running away until he thought he was safe, but then they built the bunker. There is a, a, a love story between Trotsky and, and Frida. 
There's letters that you can find as soon as we hang up, you can find them on Wikipedia. The letters written by Trotsky's wife asking Frida, why are you doing this to us? I thought you were going to help us. Why are you sleeping around with my husband? And she was only trying to get back at Diego. It's not really that she was in love with, with Trotsky. He was an old uh, Russian, uh, you know, but not only did she say she was in love with his philosophy and things, but also, uh, but also, I, I'm, I have an answer now uh, from my brother Antonio. Polacos in Santa Rosa. The Polish in Santa Rosa is a short movie. Los Polacos in Santa Rosa. I'm writing it down. I'll I'll find it. Los Polacos in Santa Rosa. Let's see. Rosa. Como se llama el porto? So anyway, when when Frida is desperately in love with this chubby but misogynist macho guy who was much older than she was, uh, they have the most amazing fiestas in their uh, in La Casa Azul. They had, like I was telling you before, all these intellectuals from all over the world. They had the photographer Western, as I was telling you, then Tina Modotti, the very famous Italian uh, photographer. Then they have Henri Cartier-Bresson. They had all this, not only in the politics, but also uh, not only the art, but also in the politics. And there's lots of books about Los Festines de Diego y Frida, about what she would cook, the huge mole for everybody. And of course, they would smoke pot, which was not very famous back in the day, but they would have lots of mezcal and lots of tequila. And there are books and books and books about pictures of their festivities in their garden, of every beautiful things that they were eating. It was amazing. I mean, they, 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 the cuisine that Frida is portraying in those books is the, the Mexican cuisine that we always have. And when you were talking about going with, with Joy to Yucatan down south in Mexico, it, the Mexican cuisine is very vast, but there's also different areas where, where the mole is done differently and the fish is done this way and then the other. So it's, it's like, Armando, how many, like at least five, no? Diferentes comidas que hay alrededor de México. O sea, hay la comida del sur de Yucatán, la cochinita pibín, la influencia maya, en el norte, eh, cabrito, eh, y diferentes por regiones. En Oaxaca, el mole negro, ¿no? Yes, it's by region. It's, so, by, it's regional, okay. But everything is UNESCO. Everything is World Heritage. But if you go south, you have different eh, food and drinks that, that you usually eh, don't in the center. Of course, you can find restaurants that will serve you the different kinds, but it's a, an amazing uh, a difference between the different states, and all of them are amazing. When you were in Yucatan, the influence of the Mayan, when they say the cochinita pibil, pibil, the pork belly that they do, the shredded one, the, the pibil is actually a Mayan name. It's an oven. It's is it, the, the pibil is an oven? It's an oven. It's the name of a Mayan oven. When they say cochinita pibil, it means that it was cooked with a Mayan oven under the ground. Wow. See, now when I think when I think of that, I think of Peru. I don't think I don't think of I don't think of necessarily Mexico, but obviously the Mayans were in Peru and they were also in Mexico. Yes. And, and the Mayans were all the way down there, but in Peru you have more Inca. Inca was also a huge empire, El Dorado and all this things that, uh, I mean, Peru is, is humongous for, for the indigenous uh, heritage too, uh, all the way down there until we, we had to divide it all because the Spaniards decided to divide it. And then we have to sell, of course, our parts of, of Mexico, like your friend in New Mexico that used to be Mexico, gracias. <laughs> I did. I know because I, I, what I need to do, and I'm sure it's on the internet and I can find it, just to see the map again, to see, okay, this is where the Aztecs were. This is where the Mayans were. This is where the Incans were. And to see how they, like, how they blended. Because after a while, it starts to just blend into just a big stew in your head. Imagine if we have 64 different languages in Mexico. 64 languages. I mean... We didn't get rid of all of them and kill them all, like it happened in other countries. We, we, we blended into them. So sometimes 
you have a nanny at home or somebody that would speak this other language and then you think this guy can talk to this other person, but no, it's a different uh, uh, pre-Hispanic language. It's amazing. But uh, to tell you the truth, the whole world speaks our language, our language, the Mexica, the Aztec. You know why? Why? Because when you say avocado, the Nahuatl word is aguacatl, and it's avocado. When you say chocolate, it's chocolate from the Aztecs. And when you say tomato, it's tomato. And it's all etymology is Mexican before the Spaniards. It's not Spanish. When you have a vanilla, everything that you have heritage, even the turkey, the Aztecs and the Mayans were the ones that domesticated the bird for you to have now for Thanksgiving. You can Google this, what I'm saying. It's not a lie. The turkey was domesticated by the Aztecs. You have a turkey once a year to commemorate that you are in the States having a very nice fiesta for Thanksgiving, and it's all Mexican. And you know what aguacatl, what aguacatl means in Nahuatl? You know what it means? No. It means testicles. Avocado means testicles. Avocado means testicles. Because Avocado. They grow in a pear on the leaf and it really looks like Of course. Like they look like huevos. They yes. look like balls. Yes. And aguacate is on huevos. It's testicles. If you put it in any other language, it yes. means testicles. Aguacate. And then you got the chocolate and then you got the tomato. And everybody thinks the tomato comes from Italy. No, 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 no. Of course they popularize it and they make it huge. But tomato comes from Mexico. You know what? You need your own show on, I don't know if we should put it on Discovery Channel or on, on A&E or like what the, I'll, I'll take, we can, we can take requests from, um, <laughs> from our chat room where you should have your TV show. But it's the, the TV show should be like why everything is from Mexico with Patricia, and and and, and color TV is from Mexico, for example. The white color TV is Mexican. Oh. The beer that can open for you, la corcholata, the the top of the of this drink is Mexican too. We just didn't, didn't how do you call it? Come register it. But it is this register it. But it's there's so much history. This is, I can't remember which which other interview this came up on. But there's so much history that you we don't necessarily know, right? Because because there is so much history in the world. There's no way it's impossible to know everything. So we know like little piece parts of things, and then we don't know like the 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 the, the true beginnings of something. Like when we were talking yesterday, when we talked about. Um, Cortez and the Aztecs and how he and I want you to tell the story but that whole notion of the fact that it made it easier for Cortez to win because he engaged all these other natives that were being oppressed by their king so it was something that Carlo Magno did or the Napoleon did he he joined forces with the enemies of this empire to win them over. But this already had happened centuries and centuries before. Uh, when 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 Cortes said, "We I only have these dirty Spaniards because they, they were dirty, not because they were ugly or anything, but they were really not showered." <laughs> the Mexicans used to shower 15 times a day. That's why we thought, "What's with them? Why are they so smelly? What's with the son of of the god?" Because the mythology of the Aztecs, regardless of the story I told you before, they also thought of the Messiah coming back, just like Christians do, or the Jewish. The Messiah is gonna come at some point. But if it's the son of the the son of the sun, and he has hairy blonde hair and blonde beard, people were hairless here. Men were hairless, no beard. So imagine when they see these people and they go like, these guys are the children of God of the sun. They are the Messiah. So they go like, wait, wait one second, Moctezuma. Just don't give them all the gold and all our women just yet. Let's see if they really are the gods. 
And then they come with their horses and they, and, they, and, they, and they have the guns. We didn't have guns because we didn't go to China to get the powder. We didn't go have to go anywhere. Why? We had everything here. We had the best fish. We, have, we still have the best fruit. We have the best vegetables. Why would we want to go abroad? Let them go abroad, the ones that have the coldest winters. We have the eternal spring. We don't need to go anywhere to find stuff. So everybody was happy here. And all of a sudden, oh, the mythology. Oh, these guys must be the children. Of the sun, these are the children of Quetzalcoatl, and they are sitting on a horse, and they have all this metal gear on them, and they're shooting their weapons, and they go, look like dragons, and and they all go like, they, of course, it's an entity. They thought the guy on top of the horse is one. It's is one thing, horse. yeah, like a minotaur, yeah. In the book of the Incas, La Visión de los Vencidos, Inca Garcilaso de la Vega, he wrote this book so that you don't think that I am lying or making up shit here. I sometimes do, but not this way. Anyway, the Inca Garcilaso de la Vega is writing, oh, we really thought these guys were the gods because they were coming and they were so, uh, the Mexicans were humble and very nice and very friendly. Of course, they were guerrillas made and they, they were sacrificing people and they, they, they could be very wild, of course, but only with a, with a, with a, a when they are trying to, to increase their empire, like it happens everywhere in the world, you fight with the neighbors. And then Cortes comes, like you were saying, and says, ah, you hate the Aztecs and you give them, them a lot of, how do you call that? Impuestos. You're going, the, you give them, taxes. You're giving them a lot of taxes and they're taking your, your women, the virgins, and your beautiful babies and noble babies, and they're sacrificing them on top of the pyramids. Don't you really want the power back to you? And Cortes gathered the whole, the whole surroundings to enforce his uh, his his, uh, empire, his, his um, army to fight the Aztecs because they were not easy to fight. And then they were so romantic that they truly believed that the Spaniards were the children of the gods. Here are my women. Here is my gold. Here you have the best turkey. Here you have my beautiful birds. Here you have everything. You know, but this book, the other book that I was telling you about yesterday, La Verdadera Historia de la Conquista de la Nueva España, when this guy that was traveling with Cortés was writing down everything, saying, this majestic uh, emperor, Moctezuma, I cannot believe the guy. He's amazing. And, 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 and he bathes so many times and he has, he has a natural springs hot springs and he sits there nobody can look him in the eye and he has all these birds, beautiful birds and he has this incredible um como se dice penacho like a crown feathered crown it's today in austria in in Vin, you can uh, see moctezuma's penacho it's there they took it sort of like a like, like it's like plumage it's like a peacock it's like i'm trying to remember what you would call it like a head a headdress it's a headdress <laughs> But they, they, the Austrians took it, took them with them, and it's now in a museum in Austria. We don't have it. The Mexican government has been fighting. We want Moctezuma's Senaco back here, por favor. But it's been so many centuries, and they are, it's so well preserved over there, and it's all natural feathers and and and, and emeralds and things that they are so scared that it will disrupt if they disintegrate. Disintegrate. So it's now there. If anybody that is there, the Germans and the Austrians that are in the chat can go to the museum in Vienna and see Moctezuma's plumage. Mm -hmm. Oh right. my God, I, that would be amazing. That would be amazing to see that. And that, that is so odd that it's in Austin, that it's in Vienna. But yeah, you wouldn't want to move it because if you moved it and then it got destroyed in the process, you would feel so horrible, right? See, see. but the, the guy, the, the Bernal Diaz del Castillo writes a lot of things about how impressed they were about the women here, half naked women with those little bodies and all tan and the wonderful hair that they had versus their own women. He makes the comparison. I'm not making it. Versus the comparison to their own women in Europe that have little hair and, and they don't have the curves and don't have the tan. And, and they were so impressed by all this and, and also about our food and about our vegetables and the, and, the, and the wealth that you could see it everywhere. You can see, still see it. There's another book more recent that says the poverty in, in wealthy countries. I think Mexico is a very wealthy country, but like Porfirio Diaz, our president would say, poor Mexico, 
so far away from God and so close to the United States. Of course, of course you're going to have a powerful neighbor that's always going to take advantage of you, that we understand. But it's not only one way. Sometimes it's two ways. We were not like all sad going like, oh, you know what they did to us? Like Galeano did in Uruguay with the 60s uh, book going like the open veins of Latin America, written everything that he was blaming on the state that, I mean, there is a powerful country, yes, but we're not stupid, you know? We know how to defend ourselves or we should learn it, you know? Or that's why we have to kill Maximiliano, sent by Napoleon to Mexico. We have to make a statement, yeah? So. It's always a statement. It's, always, it's so funny. It's so funny to watch. I'm, I'm watching the light like by me and then also the light by you that we're like, we're like sun setting, we're sun setting together. This is almost like that day at the hotel, drinking on the deck, listening to the music, hanging out. It's like, it's como igual. The live music over there. And yes, Chicago has all these seasons. When I lived there in Winnetka, it was amazing. I was asking, when is it gonna snow? When is it gonna snow? When is it gonna snow? I've never seen snow before. I always travel to Europe, but also in the summers. I never went for the snow. And then all of a sudden, when is it gonna snow? And then I went like, I thought it was going to snow for one day. When is the snow gonna end? <gasps> Look what the chef is bringing me. I'm telling you this. It's my okay. Drink. What is that? Armando, what is this? Vodka and berries. Eh? Oh my gosh. Is there soda in there too, or is it just, is that straight vodka with berries? There's gotta no, be a little bit of soda. It's a spritz, it has to have a spritz. Have a bit of spritz. Berries, a spritz, and the vodka. Ouch! Ouch. You're mixing, you're between the 40, 43 and la cerveza and the vodka. Well, amiga, you don't mix anyway. Mexicans are mixed. We cannot bitch at the Spaniards because we're half Spanish. We cannot do it anymore. We're half Spanish. We are proud of our heritage, wherever it comes from. And this is not a heritage. Vodka is not within our heritage, by the way. But still, no. You can combine. Vodka is definitely not the heritage. But you make oh, a stronger what? race, and the stronger race can hold up better. You know, I what did we have? The Carajillo. Then we had a little zip of cerveza. And then we had a little zip of tequila. And Oh, oh, yeah, amiga, you're making me drink so much. You're dangerous. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I will not lie. I will not lie. Dangerous. I know. Oh, yeah. we need to, I, I, I need to get back to San Miguel. I need to get. This is the only problem with doing this is then I see my friends and I and I recall all the memories and the city and walking down the cobblestone streets and the amazing food and the amazing people. And it's just like, oh, I, I can almost like taste it. I want to be there. San Miguel is always unbelievable. Not only Mexico, but San Miguel. And back in the day when I was telling you about the German, Alexander von Humboldt coming to Mexico, and, and he went all the way through, uh, all the way down to South America. And he wrote the most amazing books. But what he wrote most about is, uh, this is the 19th century. He wrote about Mexico like nothing before. He said Mexico is a city of the palaces, downtown Mexico. He talked about botanical, about our volcanoes, about our mountains, about everything. And guess what? He spoke and wrote so much about Mexico that there are European painters that have never been to Mexico and painted Mexico just by being inspired by the books of Alexander von Humboldt. Unbelievable. There's a whole second floor in the Sumaya Museum in Mexico City in the corner left where you can see all these European painters that were painting crazy about Mexico by reading about Mexico only without being here at all. But that makes it, it that's interesting because then, you know, when you read about something, you can come up, you can come up with the images in your head, right? Mm -hmm. You can come up with it all and then understand them. It's almost better than, it can be almost better than being there because you can just make it all up. See, sí. exactamente. So if, if the people are reading it and Alexander von Humboldt, the German, writes it so beautifully, they get inspired and they want to paint this. Even, you know what? 
there's an opera. Uh, they, 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 in, in, in Germany, before even Germany existed, uh, there was a king uh, in the part of Berlin where you were mentioning before, Wilhelm der Große, uh, the great uh, Wilhelm. He was a very important and, and, and great uh, king who fought the Habsburgs and won over a part of Austria, Schlesien, and things. Regardless of that, Napoleon got inspired by his uh, polit uh, uh, strategies because he was very good in the army. Anyway, the guy was also friends with Voltaire and everybody in, in France with the intellectuals back in the day. Uh, Montesquieu and Voltaire and all these friends. He was gay. And we were not supposed to know this, but the father was a mean guy and killed his lover and then sent him out. And he was re refuged in England. And then they talked to the, to the father and said, you are going to die and this is your only, uh, the only guy that can be the king. It's your son. You have to bring him back. So they did. But he was very not only very intelligent in the arts of the war, but also in the arts. So mm -hmm. operas, the most beautiful poems and operas he played. And amongst them is what he heard about Moctezuma, the last emperor in Mexico. So they heard of, he heard about Moctezuma and wrote an opera, full opera, about what he had read that what was going on with our last emperor. It is called Montezuma. Of course, it's not written properly, when they came to Mexico to perform the Germans, the press was like going all crazy. They're not writing it well. It's not Montezuma. I said, is this is an interpretation of a king in the 17th century. Please shush. We're not going to change the name because it's incorrect. It's just what he wrote. And it was amazing. He was a huge humanist. And really, Napoleon got inspired a lot by what he did for the wars and how he won over. And then they unified Germany. And then it became only one country but back in the day it was several it was bavaria brandenburg and different no and he was the king over here but he got inspired by Moctezuma. well it sounds like it sounds like montezuma, montezuma was a total badass no not really mm, guess what they say he was perhaps a little sissy because he like almost gave up the empire for the spaniards guess what you can see it there's on netflix is a fantastic, what's his face? John Leguizamo. He says, kiss my ass, pick. And he tells the story. <laughs> he tells the story of Moctezuma being sissy. He even walks like this and makes it fun. Oh, him. in his stand-up, in his stand-up yes. show for Netflix? Yes. And he is doing the, he was the bad guy, the bad father in the movie I was telling you about love in the time of cholera. He yep. was a new father. He's a Colombian actor, amazing, but he's, he's very amazing. Funny. Yeah, and he actually did that stand-up show in Chicago the same time when Madonna was here, doing her like cert. She did like six shows or something like that at the Chicago Theater, and then John Leguizamo came to Madonna's show and was at Madonna's show and kind of ended up being a part of Madonna's show in Chicago. But he oh. did that stand-up here in Chicago. I didn't. Oh. I, I missed it though. There's two stand up. One is called. Latin American history for morons. Mm -hmm. For the tour, he went like it's such a big name. Please forget about it. Nobody's gonna go see it. So he just changed it from Latin American. I understand this that he changed it from Latin American history for morons. He changed it to to kiss my ass. Thank. Although he's not even Mexican. He's not even Mexican. He's amazing. I love him. He is so great. He is, he's an amazing character actor. He's just an amazing, like full on actor. No matter what he does, he's brilliant. And he's funny in real life. Oh yeah. Cause of course you probably know him. You know, everybody. We know him from the love in the time of color. He was a mean father. I met him in Colombia as we were shooting the, the Bardem movie with love in the time of color that I was telling you about. And not yeah. only that, but we were casting him. For the next movie that we're gonna do that we had to stop. It is a Canadian movie with with a fantastic Canadian director, Lauro Chartran. And 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 he is in. I mean, we have John Leguizamo, uh, amongst others. I cannot give out all the names, but Leguizamo we cast it in. He's amazing. He's gonna be in the movie whenever this freaking pandemic is over. 
What do you think, because you're involved with, you know, the film festivals and, and all that, like, what do you think is going to, when do you think you'll be back up and running? Do you know? The thing is that we do um, a lot of international productions, so it doesn't really depend on how safe Mexico is or not. It also depends on how is the pandemic going if we have a Brazilian photographer. You know, it's in the international industry. You have a Brazilian photographer or a Czech photographer, and then you have a director from Africa, or you have a, you know, it varies. So it, it really has, it's, it's the whole world in, in one industry. So it doesn't only depend on when is the pandemic going to end, where? Because it's starting in different times in different places, you know? Like in Germany, it's now going down, and then in the States, it's huge, and in Mexico, it's rising. But we're not in phase three just yet. We're in the second phase. Yeah. Go we're in, yeah. And, you know, whenever yeah. we... And our industry is beaten up really, really bad because of this, what I'm telling you. But in spite of all this, everybody now in the pandemic throughout the world is watching our art, is watching Netflix series, Amazon Prime, is watching HBO, everything that we shot. Everybody's looking at it. That's how important the industry is, not only for our souls. It feeds a lot of people and it helps your, it's art in the end, you know? It's, it's, it's an art. We have to keep it alive. And, 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 and the governments might not take it serious. Because what? Cinema, you do it in the very end. Arts, what does it do? No, it keeps you alive. It keeps your soul up and running. And it, it keeps your soul up and running. And also, depending on where you live, like in Chicago, we have great tax credits. We have we have so many shows that shoot in Chicago, television shows and films that shoot in Chicago. Like Illinois has the tax credit because it is a big indicator. It's it's a it's a big it has a big impact on our economy on on Illinois' economy because when the film productions come to Chicago and Illinois, you know there's all sorts of revenue that gets generated on top of the revenue of the actual production. So it's there's there's an economic reason if people don't want to think with their heart or their soul there is, there are economic reasons for the arts as well the money drop is amazing you know there is a thing called a uh, turismo de película how would you translate it tourism like, from film yeah yeah film tourism film tourism iowa but the big stone from close encounters that, that you were not even born when it was huge. Everybody still goes there to see a stupid stone. I was still born, Kaya. What is the stupid stone? And the tourism goes on to just go see that stupid stone that is a nothingness. Well, I remember when, when I was in um, Guatemala, we that was part of like when we were in this, the, the pyramid, I can't remember which pyramid we were at, but they talked about the fact that they shot some of the Star Wars movies in Guatemala. It, but but that's not the reason why we went, you know, it, but it was just this extra add-on where it's like, oh, exactly. they, but, they, they shot know, this here. But there's people that actually travel to the places where things were shot. Oh, like, yeah. For example, not only do we leave a lot of money drop, for example, when we were shooting The Legend of Zorro in San Luis Potosí, as other state, in the mountains is where Edward James was having his surrealist castle. But regardless of that, we were shooting in the city in outside Hacienda, the Legend of Zorro. The, the, the head of the tourism board told me, Patricia, when you were shooting here, just by shooting and, and using our hotels, our service, I mean, we were living there for six months. It, it, it made what two years of tourism does. Two years of tourism is what we, we make as, as a revenue by, by shooting the movie there. You know, it's not only that you hire a lot of people and people that don't, don't even work in the industry get jobs. It's also the money job because people, the crews from all over the world move to the place. They still have to cut their hair. They still go to bars. They live in hotels. They they are, they are feed three times a day. They use the restaurants, the bars, they, everything, you know. They buy clothes over there. They, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's the, I think it's the engine of every economy. The other, that's the side, that's the side, the side show, which is 
the economy starts with the arts industry. All of the arts starts, all, all, all of the economy is driven by the arts. See, sí. and not only does it drive by, it doesn't just drive by the arts, it doesn't just end by the arts, but it also ends there. Gracias. What, you can be fed by building cars in Detroit, the Ford Motor Home, Ford Company, whatever, but what feeds your soul, what keeps you really alive is really only the bread that you pull on the table. Everybody's watching movies today. Everybody was watching movies before. Everybody is going to the galleries and watching the paintings and getting, getting moved by, by every art uh, manifestation, whether in music, in the pictorics, in the cinema. Art is really what, what, what keeps you moving. I mean, Sir Edward James, whenever you come to Mexico, I will take you to, to see the, the Gilitla thing in the mountains. Yeah. To see Sir Edward James, my friend Laura Halil is typing just now. Yes, Sir Edward James, the guy that we think is the bastard of um, Eduardo El Septimo. I mean, Sir Edward James, James in the end, but Eduardo in the beginning. Anyway, this guy uh, that was sponsoring all the surrealist women in Mexico, but they were English and Spanish, they were not Mexican, uh, did a huge uh, thing for arts. And he considered, uh, he has man, wonderful uh, quotes also, uh, that, that art it doesn't only trigger, trigger for you to be alive, it keeps you alive. It's true. Any 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 time you're in, you've got any emotion going on, you there's a movie that you can watch. There's a show you can watch. There's a different you know. There's there's something new, and and you get to understand things differently. Did you by any chance um, have you seen Unorthodox yet? No, it's on our list. It's oh my god, it's so good, Patricia. It's Unorthodox is so good. I mean, it, you have to see, and it's only the four episodes, but. We I broke it up. Oh. It's only four episodes, but we broke it up because it's very in, it's very intense, and we didn't want to like we we needed a we needed a break after they're about hour an hour long each episode, but we definitely needed a break to you know let it sink in. That's the one thing about binge watching; it makes it so easy to rip through them, but then you don't have the time to let it gel for yourself. You know what? Years ago, before the Netflix and the, and all this uh, started, uh, my brother Eric and I, because we were interested, I majored in stage design, and my brother was an actor uh, for college. It is one of my careers. The other one is hermeneutics. Don't think I was going to be an astronaut. I will tell you later what it means. Uh, we went to see the teacher of, of Marcel Marceau. He was in Mexico, and he was giving a lecture. And we went there, he was so old. And he was telling us, people usually go to a gallery and look at art and say, what does it mean? And you know what he said, and I will never forget. Imagine a day in Paris and you're walking and you're far away from home and it's like pouring rain, but it's cold. And you get all wet and all muddy and you're freezing and you're at home and you take the bus number one, bus number two, Cap number three, finally you're home, you're freezing to death, you take your clothes off, you turn on the shower, the, the water is hot and you go in there and you feel the water on you. And you don't ask, what does it mean? You don't question art, you just feel it, you know? When you truer are words, truer words were, were never sent. That's that, and well, and but that's kind of one of the reasons why I like art that there's not necessarily words to it. You know, when you're watching dance and you just can't explain it and you're just transfixed. Like when I lived in Madrid, the the the, the famous dance was, it was Nacho Duato. I don't know if he ever, if Nacho Duato ever came to, to Mexico, I'm sure he did. He like influenced Chicago dancers a lot too, but he was just amazing. Or like I finally, I got to see Barishnikov dance and oh. you're watching and you're listening to you're you're watching this story told and and by the time i saw barishnikov dance it was at the very end of his career it might have been the last time he danced in chicago or anyhow it was amazing and he, he didn't have to be the youngest strongest most flexible dancer he was fucking he was barishnikov you know it you 
your body, your whole body, it, like you can come out of your body listening yes. and seeing it. It's not about the technique. It's about what you what you uh, give to the audience. That's the importance. When you come out of there and your heart is full and you have a beautiful week and you 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 change the the way you see life and and what inspired you and you see everything beautiful again. And and when you're depressed, you look at art and then it helps you. But today, when everybody's locked in, please watch. If you don't want to watch still art, just moving art. There's lots. In Chicago, you have the best uh, uh, modern dance schools ever. You have the, the most amazing dancers in the world for, for modern dance. I mean, uh, not only there, throughout the world, everybody that's watching, just focus on art. That's gonna keep, That's what is going to keep us alive in the end. That is a weapon to fight this. It is. It, it is. There's, um, there are a couple of DJs that like every single day, they're DJing, and one of them you will love. The guy's name, he's in Paris. It's Bob Sinclair. I need to message him because I want to have him on the Global Cafe. He's amazing. It's 7 a.m. our time, and so which whatever time it is in Paris, 2 or 3 o'clock, one hour. And each day it's something different. A lot of times it's house or funk or disco, something like that. He's got his turntables out. He's wearing like amazing clothes. I'm curious if anybody, if any of your friends or any of the people in the feed have seen this live, seen him live. I'll send you, I'll send you one of his links. He's in like um, amazing clothes, amazing suits. And on Sunday, he wore this white satin robe, very short, like mid, mid, mid thigh. And he's got, you know, long hair and a beard. He knows everything about music and so he's dancing and he's talking to everybody i looked on the facebook live feed i think it was like 15 at one point it was almost fifteen thousand people live listening at the same time so every morning yeah at the same time this is not like after the fact this is like it, it'll say live in the corner and it'll say fifteen thousand. and 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 today was funk um, it, it's, he is just amazing and he is so funny. He's got a really funny sense of humor and he just has like this really big heart and he'll wish people happy birthday. He wishes people, it, it's very, it's very great. And then, um, on Twitch and on Periscope, like a lot of, um, DJs are using Twitch and Periscope and then they'll, um, there's a DJ in Chicago named Jeff Pazin and he does it at noon every day and he calls it quarantine streams. And you can, and he'll, he'll take like amazing video today. It was, um, footage like underwater footage. And then there's just great music going on. He's a, he's a, he's a wonderful DJ. And so that's going on. And then the club where I normally go dancing and joy goes here as well. Late bar. They do every night. It's a different night. Like Wednesday night is different from Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Saturday is always new wave. So I can send you that, but it's always new wave and it's always new wave music videos. So everything from like Duran Duran, Pet Shop Boys, oh it's like the movie, like so fun. They'll do like a ska set with you know, it's it's just it's 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 great. It's great, but but so it's that kind of stuff. Sometimes it makes you crave being out with people like in a, in a in a tangible way. But it's such a relief to have that art. You have to have the art. I. I you have to have the art. You know what? Because we, we lack human touch. We lack it. The Latinos are very, they always embrace, they always kiss. But also the Americans, they are very close and they and they like to gather and things. And I think art, in the end, brings us together from different countries, from different points of view. And it, 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 it accelerates our soul. That is what we're lacking today. When we're stuck at home, at least we should hear those big DJs, loud music as you are doing the stupid dishes, cleaning your house, cooking, whatever you're doing. Just listen to art and then watch it. And then your soul will get their own feed. And then you are alive. Then you see, guys, we are alive because art gives us that. That's what art was born to do. To, to to freaking feed us and to keep us alive. Let's do that. The, give us a, if you have them there, put them there on the thing so that we can just hear, even if it's Latin traditional music 
or whether it's the Narcos soundtrack music, which is amazing, by the way. Listen to the Narcos soundtrack. I'm not telling you to watch it if you don't want to, but just listen to the soundtrack. It's amazing. Yeah. And you hear it as I'm doing the dishes, because what am I going to do in, uh, here? I'm, I'm having the best uh, cook ever, in, in not only locally, but internationally. I have the, book, the best chef here. What can I do? I say, can I do the dishes? I love to cook, but I'm not going to cook here. What am I going to do? Well, it's not a competition or whatever. I have the most amazing chef. I said the first day I'm going to do the dishes, and everybody believed it, and I've been doing the dishes forever. But guess what I do? I play the soundtracks to the most amazing movies. And very out loud. And even if it's one in the morning, I play it out loud as I'm doing the dishes. And you know what? I don't feel that I'm doing the dishes. I feel that I'm being alive. Oh, I feel totally. That it's my soul. It's amazing. Art can do that for you. And and, and everybody's watching the, the freaking Netflix or whatever you want to watch. It's still art out there. It's still art. It's it's it's, still it's art. also art. It's still but art. it's I, I do think there's an opportunity when we have a little bit of extra um, space, like soul, soul space, whatever. Like the um, all the a lot of the museums have online have online have ways to look at things online, right? So if there's a city that you've never been to that you want to go to, all you have to do is look on the internet and see if those museums are available. Like I'm going to look. I'm going to see maybe that museum in Vienna. I can look at Montezuma's, maybe there'll be a virtual reality 3D yes. head, headdress. Who knows? Maybe. I don't know. The, for, in, sure, in like, for sure. For sure. Right. And the Illinois Holocaust Museum here, like they, every week we get a notice of what, you know, different exhibits that you can look at online through the Holocaust Museum. And that might not necessarily be a museum that is like super positive, like super, um, light it's going to be very it's it's going to be intense but you could see oh yeah you've got the light on now i need to i need to i need to, i need to like get up and go to light but i'm afraid if i get up you know we've been talking for so long and pretty soon i'm going to have to pee you know and then and then it's like it's then it's all over because i'll break i'll break the seal but no boy am i me okay <laughs> you know alcohol accelerates your hormone and then you have to pee more and and, and I, I'm now guessing that Americans cannot hold it that long. <laughs> That's okay because I have I have the God of Prince looking over me. If you can see that little candle in the background, that's my that's still my that's my Prince candle that's oh. still going. See, show us the Prince candle and the Guadalupe Virgin. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on. Oh, they're both still lit. I think. Oh, La Virgen. Yes, I, I think it's 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 gone. So. Here's the Virgin, Virgin yeah. of Guadalupe. Yeah. Beautiful oh, Virgin of Guadalupe. Beautiful. And then my fella. Purple rain. Purple rain. Come on. Come on. My uh, did you ever did you know Bonnie Van Steen? Oh, I just the candle just went out. Um, did you know Bonnie Van Steen? She worked at um, Leo Burnett. Tim Ponarelli knows knows Bonnie, but um, she gave she gave me that candle. And then I'm wearing, of course, my Prince my Prince top because. Ouch! Porque hoy es el día el aniversario el aniversario de su muerte. I know. I was telling you there was a film festival here in San Miguel in Guanajuato. And the prince had recently died. What do we do now? So the Universidad de Guanajuato has a big stairway and it, be, it became an auditorium and there was a huge screen there. And the, the Purple Rain uh, movie with Apollonia Six was playing as the light, purple light was falling on the audience as Purple Rain, it was so beautiful. It was an homage for him. Have I, I can't remember. Have you ever did you ever see him perform? No. Live, no. Live, like that, me in the audience, no. But one of his of, of the video clips that he made, Cream and in, in what was Cream, it was directed by Salma Hayek. Oh, was it really? Yes. And the quinceañera fiesta for Salma Hayek 
my future ex-husband was one of the chamelanes. You know, when there's a quinceañera, there has been a group of boys that are very handsome, dancing uh, waltz and whatever. That's our Austrian heritage from the Maximilian I was telling you about. But it remained. The more, now more uh, uh, frequent outside Mexico, the, the Mexican heritage remains with the quinceañeras and they all dance a waltz and then they do modern dance or whatever. And, but the first they dance with the chambelanes and my ex-husband was one of the chambelanes. When I say my future ex-husband, sometimes it's because when I'm telling the story, he's not just yet there, the ex-husband, you know? Like he used to say, I cannot believe you, Patricia, this is the most boring job you have. Because he comes to, he comes to the set and see us doing the same scene over and over and now the camera from here and the same thing over and over. They don't understand this is art. But one time it was Pierce Brosnan in the middle of the largest bullfight arena in the world. And they, we have tons of extras around it. And they're all and they're all screaming at the same time. And then again, and there's Pierce Brosnan in the middle looking up to the crane and the car is up there and he's crying blood and he's screaming at the crane at the camera and everybody goes ah. it's the most exciting scene ever so i say i tell my husband come see the scene come so you understand this because he always went like what a boring job yeah so he comes and sees this and everybody goes ah. And then Pierce Brosnan crying tears of blood. And then he saw it for the third time. And then again, he went like, what a boring work. Yeah. And I go like, you're killing me. What do you want from me? What do you want? <laughs> so he never really understood this thing. And as we were shooting The Legend of Zorro, the fantastic, amazing director, Martin Campbell, also produced by Anna Roth, by the way, we're shooting this. And there's a very incredible uh, team of the group that is doing the making of. They're from New Zealand. These guys are amazing. So we arranged with Martin Campbell. He was playing along because we were doing a little video for the rap party, you know? So uh, for the rap party, you see the video starts. Coldplay was just starting. Nobody had heard about Coldplay. And the song in the background was and nothing else compares. And then Martin Campbell sitting by the camera and this little Mexican from the catering says, Senor, you want a, a coffee? And Martin Campbell says, Expresso, por favor. And then the little guy starts running and there's a camera following him. Following him, the camera, the steady cam is following him and he goes by where the horses are being trained. And then he runs by where the big dresses for Catherine Zeta Jones are being embroidered. And then he continues running and they see the construction team work, working on, on 18, 1810 San Francisco, building the whole town, you know? And then he continues running and then he enters the catering tent, an espresso for para el director, por favor. They give him the espresso and he returns the other way where the stunts are rehearsing. The stunts are doing the flip-flops and are doing the jumps and are doing the, all the craziness. And then he continues running and there's a, a whole bunch of little children rehearsing for her, their scene. And then he continues running and you see everything that happens on a set and behind the set. And then he approaches Martin Campbell and says, Senor, here is your espresso. And then Martin Campbell grabs the espresso and drinks it and says, it's cold, and throws it away. <laughs> but in the background, all the time you can hear, and nothing else compares. And then I look at my husband to see whether he's understanding this or not. And I look at him, and I see him, my future ex-husband is crying. And finally, he understood what we do. It's it, it's so amazing. I mean, now I have a preference for post production because that's what I did for so long. And there's something really fun about there are no more choice. There, are, there like all of your shooting choices are done, right? Because the shoot is over. Here's your footage. Thank you very much. This is what you have. Okay, thank you. And then you have to, and then at that point, everybody starts making all sorts of decisions that they never would have thought about before. They start 
you know, good directors, they look at their film and they see something new that they didn't see when they were shooting it. The film editor is working on it. The film editor starts to see things that is, uh, you know, details that are completely new. The writer's involved. And then you start thinking, okay, well, wait a minute. How, like, how will music feed into this? Okay, well, now you've got the music element and then you've got the special effects. And then, okay, what kind of color, like what kind of style of color do we want to put into it? So like for me, it's sort of like the, the, the shoot is where you're getting all the ingredients, right? And you're, that's like the main ingredient. It's like, that's the beef. Like if you're making a barbacoa taco, like the beef is your dailies, but then you get it into post-production and it's like, okay, now what are we gonna do with this? because there are all of these possibilities now. And at the same time, there's limitations because this is the footage, right? It's like, las dos cosas a la misma vez. And it's great. You're making the soup with the ingredients you have right there. Put it on a plate. Y comala. Co co y y, y comala. Yeah, Put it on a plate and eat it. Of Put course. it on a plate and eat it. It works as an editor. Of course, it's such a huge ingredient to the soup. I, for the longest, I, when I initially got into post-production, it's because I thought I wanted to be a film editor and I loved music. And I talked about, you know, being a teenager and making mixtapes and creating a story and a flow and like the ebbs and the, like the hills and the valleys of a story and, to, and, and how much I love film. Right. So I thought I wanted to be a film editor. And then they were like, okay, well, you're going to be sitting watching hours and hours of footage by yourself working with and I was like uh yeah that's not gonna work for me because it's, it's <laughs> obviously right. obviously well, that's not gonna work for me do you remember the movie uh como se llama esta película like children of men or something like this oh, oh yeah children of men or yeah. yeah Alex Rodriguez is a Mexican editor lives in San Francisco he was nominated for an Oscar for this movie just by editing it. He was incredible. And of course, the next step after being a film editor for so long is directing. And he wants to direct his film first um, independent short movie. He wrote it. And then he said, Patricia and Antonio, Antonio, my brother, can you please produce this for us? And we did. It is a very funny story. Uh, it went to Cannes, it went to several film festivals, and, and Alex Rodriguez, who's an amazing editor, I said, you're a huge director, but please don't lack us of your editing, man, because film that needs you, because he's amazing, he's an artist. I cannot believe how precious his art is. He's a, also an incredible director, but what he does for editing, if we lose him, for him being becoming a uh, director, we're gonna lose a lot, you know, because he's amazing. He's a Mexican. You know how how much the Mexican are influencing the, the international cinema, no industry. You know of our Iñárritus and no Iñárritu is amazing. All of our great ones and and how well they're doing abroad. It's a little sad because they needed to go outside to come inside again. <laughs> But otherwise, nobody ha would have ever seen them, you know? And, and, and what they are doing, not only for the industry, but also talking about human rights, talking about immigration, talking about, it's very important what they are putting out there, you know? It, and I think when you are become on this platform and you have all these followers and you are able to talk about uh, what, what really is, 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 is uh, bothering you, of what happens in the world, it's very nice that you decide to use this platform to communicate the rest of the world what you think is shitty out there. And there's a lot of shit out there. I think with this pandemic, we're gonna learn a lot. You have to watch the Mexican directors' movies, and even if they are abroad and made in Spain or made in the USA or wherever it's made, if you see this and you listen to these guys, and we will all understand a lot, you know? And it's very beautiful that this is going on. This is a good side of it. It's not good that we're all locked in, but we have to look at the bright side of it. Like, uh, how are these English guys called? Always look on the bright side of life. 
Oh, is that um, Monty? What's um, so, uh, what is the name of the guy that came for the film festival? Kerry, Kerry, Terry Gilliam came. Oh, Terry Gilliam! Oh my God, he's from brilliant. From Guanajuato, he came, and he was here giving lectures and talking about cinema just last year, just now, last summer. I know what he did last summer. You know what he did last summer. Terry Brazil. He's he, he, he directed Brazil, right? He was Brazil, right? Brazil. He was Brazil. Of course. Yeah, that's, that, 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 that's one of my favorite movies. I and love Life Brazil. of Brian. Life of Brian, yeah. And there's where the sun comes in. We always look, like, look on the bright. All these guys started on the small screen, but then they gained weight and moved to the largest screen. <laughs> that's right, because he was originally in Monty Python, yeah? Yes. And it was all TV for the for English. Yeah. Uh, for England TV. Oh, you're talking about India. Not only we have lots of gossip still going on here, historical gossip that we have been forgetting about. Okay. Remember that Bardem made the movie called Before Night Falls. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a story about a Cuban poet called Reinaldo Arenas. Reinaldo Arenas, this incredible poet, it's a true story. This guy is gay. And all of a sudden, Castro decides to put him in jail because he's gay. I cannot blame Castro because this was going on all over the world. The whole world was against gays. So anyway, I have a, a gay son that I'm very proud of, by the way. He's a huge artist, an incredible photographer, and a really good architect. But regardless of that parenthesis, this Reynaldo Arenas guy who was gay, and the, and the Cuban police put him into jail, and then Schnabel shot a movie called before Night Falls, and by then before him doing the crossover, was shooting this movie, and then right after we shot Love in the Time of Cholera in Colombia. Anyway, but then as Reynaldo Arenas goes to jail for being gay. So the entire uh, um, intellectual community, the writers from Latin America, the Borges, and the, and, and, and the, and the everybody, the Garcia Marquez, everybody was, Castro, what are you doing, man? Why are you putting him in jail? He's one of us. Don't do this. Uh, you're almost like Stalin. What is it that you're doing there? And, he, and then he said, it's the system, and we have to work with the system. And then Garcia Marquez turned his back on the others. And then he said, Castro is doing well. And, and yes, he deserves to be in jail. And everybody turned his back on, on, on Garcia Marquez. What's going on with this bastard? Why is he backing up the, the fact that one of our poets are going is going to jail because of his gay uh, manner? And then um, Garcia Marquez sees that everybody's turning in the back on him, and he starts the the cinema school in 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 Havana. In Havana. And everything. Of course, everybody liked him back, and nothing happened. It was just a little period of time. But then, guess what? In the meantime, Tunic. Remember Tunic, the guy that invented the computer that decoded the Nazis' uh, information. It, there was a movie. What was it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what's his socks was in it? Um, oh gosh, he's so brilliant. Oh, what's his name? I hate that when it's like he. he, he He's been in so many things, and I'm, and I'm picturing oh, him right now. La película, la de Tunic, este, de, 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 todo, de codifican todos los, la, con la computadora gigantesca, todos los códigos nazis. ¿Cómo se llama? It's so funny. I'm like looking at the computer right now. But yes. Eddie Redmayne. Eddie Redmayne. So imagine, in real life, the movie doesn't tell this, but in real life, this guy, uh, discovered the, the found a way to make this incredible computer to decode the Nazis information to know where they were going to go Normandy or this or there or Belgium or whatever they were doing and he decoded it so that the English knew uh, and the other amigos knew how to beat the Nazis right he basically saved the world from the Nazis right next thing you know He's in his home. He was gay, but nobody knew. He was married, but he was really gay. Back in the day, you could not say, I'm gay, whatever. No. You have to no. pretend and then get married and have children, even if you're gay. 
like James Burroughs talking back from the beat. He was gay. Maybe it wasn't such an accident with the William Tell. But regardless of this, so this guy, the tunic guy, uh, knew later in the time that the, that the English police was going to get him because he, the, he was found out that he was gay. So when the police knocks on the door, I can't knock on the door, silly. Oh my goodness. <laughs> the dogs think it's for real. That happens to me too. Ay, Lola. Lola thinks somebody's knocking at the door, but they were knocking at the door. So he knows that they are coming to get him, to put him in jail because he's gay and it was not allowed. So you know what he does? He put venom in, veneno in, in a, a syringe and puts it in an apple and bites the apple to commit suicide in front of the police when they walk in. And he dies because he preferred to die than going to jail for being gay. And then, you know, Steve Jobs makes an homage because he invented the computers and he does the Macintosh and the Apple and the beaten Apple for the for our iPhones and our computers that we're using today. It's an homage to Tunic because he was serious with that biting the Apple because he didn't want to go to jail because he was gay. That's why when you buy an Apple product, there is always the el, el holograma the the como se dice I don't speak Spanish nor English anymore. Um, el arco iris, you know the 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 flag for for the gays are of course. Oh, it's a rainbow. The rainbow and the it's rainbow. An apple. It's a big apple, apple with a rainbow. I told you the rainbow because of tunic. He's making an homage to tunic. How is that? I don't understand why that's not common knowledge. Like I am just it's learning about that. Right now. But the Wikipedia party. <laughs> I know you're, yeah, the wiki party, the wiki party. The wicked, wicked party. The no. wicked party. Oh, the yeah. wicked, the wiki, wiki party. Sorry, I'm not lying. Wiki, wiki, wiki party. Yes, this is true story. I'm not lying. And then an homage. And two years ago, two years ago, the English queen said, oh, okay, we are going to take the charges away from Tunic. Only two years ago. What are you talking about? He went to jail. He died for you. And he saved us all. And now you're saying, okay, he never should have gone to jail. Arco Iris. That's how you say it in Spanish. Arco no, Iris. Sí. Claro. Gracias, Alice. So, at least Apple and Macintosh is making are making an homage to this guy that died for technology to save our lives. Well, he didn't oh. die for technology. He died for his values that he like valued himself and and who he was as a person and a, 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 over going to jail. But he saved everybody because of technology, for yeah, sure. Correcto. The same thing that happened to Renaldo Arenas that in Cuba went to jail. Around the same time was my father performing in Tropicana in Cuba for the opening night of the Tropicana in Cuba. You know? But that's only uh, another historical uh, parenthesis. But going back to the thing, it's very important that the gay art is amazing. We all love them. And what they bring to community is unbelievable. And why are we judging anyways? There's this, there's that, and there's the others. So why are the, the population judging and used to judge anyways? And they yeah. missed out on so many great people, writers, composers, even the king I'm telling you about, the German king. Max, Max, was it Max? Maximilian? No. No, Wilhelm. Oh, it's Wilhelm, Wilhelm, Wilhelm. The I, there are so many kings and emperors. We've covered a and lot of kings and emperors. Also, the, the big kings of encyclopedistas from France were also gay. So what? Why do we have to say this was a woman, this was a guy, and this was a gay? We don't consider him. Then when they bring so much to our communities and to our lives and to our history. 
It's true. And there's a whole wide range. It's, you know, it's the, 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 the sexual range and the range of gender is evolving and shifting and we get to see it and experience it. And it's so, have you on Netflix, have you watched Pose? Not yet. Pose is brilliant. But I mean, the dancing, I the music, the it's, it's evolving today. I think they were there all the time. No, I'm certain they were there all the time. It's just now that they can speak out and manifest. You know, it's they, they've been there forever. It's not that we the society created this new thing. No, they were there all the time. Yeah. Just today we are able to look at them, which is very sad. And we have to take into an account that they, we all have one world and one gender only. Or no gender or yeah. genders or or whatever, whatever, whatever you pick. One of my favorite, 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 favorite play or musicals and movies is Hedwig and the Angry Inch. You've seen Hedwig, right? <laughs> so good oh my gosh that i can and that i can listen to that soundtrack over and over again hedwig you know what we have to do we have to consider what monty python said always look on the bright side of life we have to listen to big music we have to look into the arts we have to look at a lot of movies and we have to keep our spirits up because we're locked down but we're not lacking of people because we see them and art only enhances our spirits like people normally do. But since we don't have people close around, let's do, let's focus on the art. Regardless of what kind of art you prefer or what kind of music or gender of, of whatever, art is salvation to it. It is. It's like, it's, and, and that is, I think, a perfect place for us to come to a close because then, I can pee. Yeah, that's that's too much information. I'm letting the entire world know that She's right now that she wants to pee. My mother would kill you. I I know. I you know there are certain things that I do. Kenny says every now and again he'll be like, "Don't forget, you're a little bit white trash." I don't know. Do you know? Do you know the term white trash? Yes, but you're not. I mean, no, I'm not. No, I know. He teases me. It's because I like Miracle Whip. And um, do you know what Miracle Whip is from your time in Winnetka? Winnetka, Illinois is like a Winnetka, Illinois. There, well, there are two types. Uh, there's like two kind of brands of sort of may mayonnaise. So there's mayonnaise, like Hellman's mayonnaise, and then there's this thing called Miracle Whip. And Miracle Whip is like mayonnaise, but it's a little sweet. It's a little tangy. My house was a Miracle Whip house. It, it you know, it's sort of like um, you root, you're rooting for a football team. Right. Or in Chicago, you either like the White Sox or you like the Cubs. The You're Cubs. not supposed to like both. Right. So I like Miracle Whip. And so he said he says, oh, well, because you like Miracle Whip and other people can weigh in on this. Joy, actually, we talked to Joy about it. Like Joy is like, oh, no, not Miracle Whip, not Miracle Whip. It was like it, it was like this internal battle, Miracle Whip versus Hellman's. And now, like, all, oh, and Drew, yeah, 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 Clark is saying all craft made. Yeah, craft makes both of them. But anyhow, so that's why he calls me white trash. But, that, oh. but, that's, but that's fine. That's what happened. We, we sat here for what? It's, eight, it's 8.30. We started at 5. So we talked for like three and a half hours. I had the car, un carajillo, un carajillo, carajillo, right? And then I had espresso and booze and then i haven't quite finished i mean i haven't i've got like this much left of my miller high life so that's only basically like one drink for the whole time mm -hmm. not bad not bad yeah. if we were alive together I be to be. i'm having my incredible berries cocktail for my favorite chef armando pratt's chef what's for dinner What's for dinner? What did, what's Armando making for dinner? I have no idea. <gasps> Tenemos que saber eso. It's, it's, it's always a surprise around here. Always a surprise. Let me see. Yeah, find out. We want to know. I should. Where did everybody go? <laughs> they're, all they're like, they're so done with you. They're like, oh, come on, Patricia. You, you've been, you've been on call me again. <laughs> 
I go like, what are you talking about? Man, no, nobody's here anymore. Ah, Maybe she has a raise in your hands. Nina, what's for dinner? What would Mimi ask? We need to tell the world what's for dinner. What's for dinner? We need to tell the world. Ask the chef Frost what he's baking for dinner. I need to tell everybody. Oh yeah. And and this chef, this amazing chef, world known, as I was telling you before, he grills the lamb against this thing humongously. And then you know what he does? He does banana leaves all over on a wooden thing. But this is a humongous plate. Now, it's a circle that it's almost four meters uh, long. And then on the, on, the, uh, on the other end, he burns a, a corn leaves. And then he smokes the oysters. Ay, mama. With the coconut and the banana leaves on top, and you cannot believe how it tastes. He's world famous for his things. Oh, yeah. I don't know. He, they're not responding. They're hidden in the kitchen. They're hiding in the kitchen. I know they better not be, they better not be eating your meal. They better, they better be saving it for you. <laughs> la reina, la reina. And then we hit the paella, which was uh, incredible, you know. You're killing me. I got to have some paella. I will look, there's a, there's a Spanish restaurant near us and I have to see if they're doing takeout because I'm craving paella. I could make it, but it's not. I, it, it's a lot of work to make paella just for like a small group of just for three of us. I know, but you can buy paella for paella the kilo, I guess. A kilo is like for a person and a half. Uh, uh, let's think how much, how hungry you are. But usually a kilo is for a person and a half. So you have to get two kilos. Yeah, we'll get. I'll get some paella. I also I could cook up a tortilla española. That would be good. But you've got me thinking about you. You've got me thinking about paella. Last week we made these barbacoa tacos that were to die for. You know, oh my we, gosh! We make tacos out of everything. You know, we make tacos out of rice. We we just scramble an egg on the rice and we put it on a tortilla. Whatever is there, you make a taco. Out you of make it. a taco out of it. Yes, yeah, yes. I might have tacos for dinner. I think we've we've got we've got tortillas. And you know, I didn't give you the recipe for that. Uh, an incredible easy salsa. Here you go. Yeah, we have a pan. We have a comal in Mexico. Comal, but you don't have to have it. Comal is also an Aguadul word. So it's like a pan. It's open, no rings, but we got. Put the tomatoes. It can be the tomatillos, the green ones. It can be the red ones. Burn them. Burn them from every corner. Also the chilies. You burn them. Burn them. Don't worry. Put it in a blender. I'm giving you the, the easy way out because actually you should have a molcajete and do the stone thing and whatever. But I'm giving you the easy recipe. So you put them in the blender. Water, a bunch of salt, onion. You blend it together, and then as it, it as it is blending in a pan with with manteca, you put a little piece of onion and you let it burn, almost burn, very dark, almost burn. Leave it there, and then you add the thing that is in your in your freaking blender, and you put it in there, and you let it let it boil for a while. Perhaps it needs an additional salt, and then guess what? You let it there cook for 15 minutes and then you have a salsa for all week long for your chilaquiles, for your enchiladas, for everything that you need. Even for a rare random soup that you're doing, just add the salsa. Put it in a jar, a glass jar, and keep it in your fridge and then you use it anytime you want. I and am sal salivating. It well, can last for over a week. It is a, a, an important recipe that you can all have at home. It's well, it, and and the secret is that is the fire roasting. The secret is to is to make the tomato, the fire roasted tomatoes and the fire roasted chilies. Everything, because then it gives it that like earthy, burnt flavor. And then, guess what? Not only are you eating healthy, but the spice you're eating gives you all the vitamin C that you're lacking of. <laughs> you and the chilies and the vitamin C. It's back. It is back. And it's here to stay. And it's here to stay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Te echo de menos. Um, I didn't show you my I didn't show you my earrings. I've got little um you're not gonna be able to see them. Maybe can you see that it's uh 
these are Day of the Dead earrings. I think I got these maybe in, um, I think I got these in San Miguel. One is, oh, I always forget no. that it, one, one is, one is a skull. This one's a skull and then this one's a skeleton. Isn't it but, beautiful to laugh about death? Isn't it beautiful the day of the dead and the whole art around it, the folk art around it? You did you see the folk movie from from Disney in Pichas? Yeah, I've seen it. I think I've seen it three or four times. Oh, I try. Is it amazing? But La Llorona, man, and that is inside the soundtrack of the Narcos. It put on Spotify, a uh, Narcos. Uh, a soundtrack, soundtrack. And you will listen to this amazing but also we i mean the the, the yorona song has been played by all the symphonicas around the world it's a beautiful song but the yorona is a woman that cries for her children for the day of the dead and it's beautiful and that i have to say that might be my and this is saying something because it's disney but that might be my favorite Disney film ever because they so beautifully captured, you know, crossing over and the brilliant colors and the the spirit animals and like the longing for family and the honoring honoring your heritage and then also sort of the um and the dog being the one that follows you and guides you through the afterworld. The dogs. That dog reminds me so much of my dog Hudson that died last year. It's so much of my dog Hudson because it, they look it looked kind of similar and it was kind of silly, but um, yeah, it, it's it's true because animals that's there are spirit guides, and they and sure. they twinkle this horse this the dog they're from back in the day. We still have them. They're the most expensive dogs in the world. They show us twinkle. They would hit. The, the feet of Moctezuma when he would sleep. They would put the dog on his feet for him to be covered at night with heat. And then he, he was a dog that would guide you to the afterworld. Can you believe it? It's amazing. And But guess what? The guy, the, when you see the making of the movie, they came to San Miguel to the Day of the Dead and found and interviewed such a bunch of people regarding it. Yes, San Miguel has a lot to do with this movie. No me di cuenta. I didn't. Yeah, I didn't. Re I didn't realize no, that. You don't realize it uh, uh, unless they talk about it in the in the in the making of. You don't know about it. But in San Miguel, we celebrate the Day of the Dead like there's no tomorrow, <laughs> and, and, and it is amazing. We all dress up. We get. We make our faces. We dress up like a tree nurse. And, and we dress up with the fancy uh, French dresses because the story, the Katrina story, is another story. But you gotta pee. What do I do? Do I tell the story? Do you want to tell pee? the story? I can, I, I can hold it. I, I, I'm still gonna finish this, and I, I will hold it. Again. The Katrina is is a, a a woman in a skeleton woman dressed like a French woman. We're making fun back in the day in the 40s. We were making fun. Of the French women in the in the as I told you, we had two French. Uh, uh, I lost every word. I don't speak English anymore. Um, so um, they were making fun of the this Posadas guy was making fun of the French women dressed up with the big hats and everything, and they turned it, her into a skeleton, and it, we became popular. So everybody wanted to be a Katrina. We do parades about the Katrina. Even in the 007 movie, you can see the Day of the Dead parade with the Katrinas. And not only that, Diego Rivera painted a walk in the Alameda, El Paseo por la Alameda, which is by parenthesis, downtown, a park in Mexico City, which is the oldest park in the continent, the Alameda Park. A walk in the Alameda. So he paints Lenin and Marx on the left, and all of whatever he's painting and in the center, you have the Katrina. Katrina is very important. It's a skeleton dressed up as a French woman. The Katrina in the parades, and it's very important for us. And we make poems about, even if I love you very much, I would write a poem about how much I would love for you to be dead on the 2nd of November. And I would send you a poem about a, Una Calavera, it's called. I will send it to you and you would read I, why would Patricia want me dead? No, it's because I love you that I would write a poem and I would say specific things about your life 
and how your after world would be like. And it's all a fun and jokes because we laugh about this, you know? It's, it's, it's interesting. It's such a different approach than, um, than how death is dealt with in, 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 the, in the States. In Occident, of course, in the whole world. But this is a Mexican tradition that comes from before the Spanish. This is way before the Spanish that we would celebrate the day of the dead. And that's what Diego Rivera saw when he was living up in the hills with his mates and things that were raising him with the candles and the flowers and the colors in the day of the dead celebration, where we go to the cemetery and bring tequila and mole, food and everything, tortillas and big music to celebrate the death of our father. No? Oh, you're not, we're not, okay, but you're not, we're not celebrating the death of them. We're celebrating the, the spirit. Their, their life, yes, yes, yes. We're celebrating the life. We're celebrating mm -hmm. the, because exactly. Because you on the grave whatever he would love best. If he would like the mole, whether he wants the carnita, prefer the other tacos, whatever you put there, and you give them the alcohol that he prefer, the liquor that they prefer. A Maybe picture, a Miller High Life? A picture uh, the picture of the person that uh, of the dead person, candles, the flower, the flower, the orange flower, that is only once a year in Mexico. We 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 breed them and we have them only for once a year, and we put them in our altars. And in every Mexican household, you have a Mexican uh, Day of the Dead altar, and you have the, your dead ones, and you celebrate their lives with you. And it's very beautiful because you never forget them. What they say in the Coco movie is true. It, they will never be uh, unknown unless you remember them every year. And we do. We do. We celebrate their death. And we eat whatever they love to eat. And we listen to the music that they love. And we dance to that. And we drink to that. You know? Yeah. yeah. And, well, and, and that whole concept of the second death in Coco. Mm -hmm. Like, like the day that we, your second death is when there's nobody alive that remembers you. If nobody remembers you, you're not there. But remember me. See, it's beautiful. And La Llorona and all these stories that, that, that uh, is in it. And, and, and the Llorona song, they all think it's recent. No, it's pre Spanish. It's before the Spaniards. This woman was crying for her children because the Spaniards couldn't kill almost everybody, even the children. So she was out there crying for the souls of her children. And we still commemorate that today. Imagine, it's beautiful. Yes, it is. The, day the, day, the Day of the Dead is our world heritage, really. UNESCO, world heritage. I'm not thinking this one. No, it's, it's, and it's, and it's important because there's not, a, there, there's, there's, there, there, there's nothing like it. Okay. So gosh, for people who joined us late, go back and, 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 and watch from the beginning because we've covered Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera. We've covered Patti Smith, um, James Burroughs, Neil Cassidy, the Beatniks. We've covered um, the Aztecs and Cortez and Montezuma. We've covered the Habsburgs, um, Sir Edward James. We've covered um, who else? Wilhelm, the you know the Gay King. We've covered Patricia's stories from being on set and being you know and that and her family lineage and her dad with the symphonies in Berlin and Tokyo and Stockholm and Israel and like we've I, I we've covered a recipe for salsa we've talked about drinks cocktails car carajillo we've talked about food we've talked we've talked we've covered a lot yes this is this is this is this is what you get when you have a human entity that is like wikipedia aka wiki patty <laughs> see it's crazy it's crazy so thank you for being on this wild ride with us and Patricia, thank you so much. This has felt like I, like I said, it felt like we were at that hotel because it was very specific. We were going there in like late, like middle, late afternoon because the whole point was to be there for while the sun was still up and then go through the sunset 
and then into the evening. And, and that's exactly what we did. And the yellows and the oranges. And when I moved from Mexico City to the to, to San Miguel, and my children would ask, what is going on with heaven? And my, pa my parents had passed away and I said, los abuelos, they are painting the skies for you so that you have a new home here. And they all loved it. And my parents are here and they really called us. And that's why we are living in San Miguel. I love it. I love it. And I will definitely be back to San Miguel. There's no sure. doubt about that. And everybody and else too. And, and so thanks everybody that hung out with us. Thanks to everybody who didn't hang out with us live, but hangs out with us later. Thanks for coming to Mimi's Global Cafe. I'm not sure where the next stop on my little Concord plane virtually is going to be, but we'll find something soon. Patricia, mwah. besos y abrazos. Beso. See you soon here in Mexico. Claro. Okay, ciao. Bye, amiga.